The next generation of um, future leaders is, I guess, the, the tech adopters and the, and, the, and the drivers that are going to do the step change in both profitability and productivity um, so we can hit that uh, big target that FFN has set us. But I'm probably not going to jump into so much the tech side of things and um, I'm not going to jump into how technology can improve productivity. Wanker sponsorship presentations where it says, oh, go and use Auctions Plus, how great is Auctions Plus? So what I've tried to do is uh, sit down with the committee and, and align to the overarching theme and, and, and hopefully tell a few stories. Um, so that's the angle that I've taken the presentation today. It's a massive honour to be presenting to you guys, um, having been on the committee nine years ago uh, and having sat through every forum ever since. Uh, I think this one's a little bit earlier uh, in the morning than previous forums and hence why the crowd's a little bit light on. Um, so I think we normally pushed it back to about 9, 9.30 knowing that everybody was still a little bit dusty. Now I remember a lot of things from that 2012 Next Gen Forum. I remember I was, I was a little bit dusty from the Forex garden. Um, I remember that my feet were throbbing from standing on the cement all week. But of all the things I remember, I can't for the life of me remember who spoke. Um, and I can't remember anything they said. So knowing that, if I can't make, speak, make this speech memorable, I'll at least make it short. My presentation title is How to Think. Now I have to admit, I took some time getting my head around what to talk to you about. Firstly, because talking about yourself is uncomfortable. But if I listen to my own advice, then you just have to get comfortable in the uncomfortable. The main reason though, is that the beautiful thing about us all is that we actually all think differently. And that's really important. And it's actually those different lenses that when they come, come together can create build and impact in a way that is just so powerful. So with that, I'm hoping it won't be a traditional preso. I'll tell you some stories from my past, but I have no interest in the retirement of most personal reflections. It's not an advisory speech and I'm not here to preach or tell you what to do. Perhaps think of it as an approach. I'm here to share stories, insights, philosophies that can be objectively understood if, and if you choose, subjectively adopted. By either changing your reality, or simply changing how you think about stuff. Think of it as a couple of moves from a playbook, which is based on the adventures of my life. Adventures that are significant, enlightening, funny, sad, and human. There'll only be a couple of takeaways, likely no silver bullets, but perhaps a nugget or two that may help, may help you now or later. Now in writing this speech I remembered lessons I'd learned and forgot, answers to questions I had, reminders of questions I still have, affirmations for continued doubts, beliefs on what matters, theories of life, contracts I've made with myself, many of which I'm living up to, but actually most I'm still pursuing. So before I kick off, I wanted to share some facts to help set the table. I'm the oldest brother of three and the son of parents who gave everything to see their children live a fulfilled life. We've had some huge blow-ups and massive fallouts. But when all's said and done, and we say I love you, we do mean it. I've had one near-death experience when I was buried in an avalanche in the high country of war-torn Kyrgyzstan. I've walked the cap in Milan, Paris and London. Two of my heroes are Rocky and Muhammad Ali. Not because I like boxing, I definitely a lover, not a fighter, but because they worked out who they wanted to be, not what they wanted to be. As a child, all I ever wanted to, all I ever wanted to be was a driver. I'm an optim optimist by nature and humour is one of my greatest teachers. It's helped me deal with pain, loss, control and lack of trust. And my wife told me last night when I was practicing, it's really helped me being a control freak. I'm not perfect, no. I step in crap all the time. Sometimes I recognise it happening and sometimes I need help. I've just learned to scrape it off my boots and keep walking. 
We all step in crap from time to time. We hit roadblocks, we stuff up. We get stuffed around, we get sick. We do not get what we want. Stepping in crap, in crap is inevitable. So let's either see it as good luck because we learned something or figure out how to do it less often. I hate plan B because you essentially say, if my plan doesn't work, then I've got a fallback plan. And if you start thinking about plan B, which takes away, it takes away all the time and energy about thinking about your ultimate goal. Now we all do this. It's a safety net to protect ourselves from failing. So with that, let me kick into a couple of stories. Me in school never worked. It's the whole, it's me, not you, not the, it's you, not me. I spent years daydreaming in the back of the classroom about life on the land, about marrying my sweetheart, and about living a life without a care in the world. Many a teacher would describe me as a daydreamer, and it continually made my parents' hair fall out. Well, let me tell you that there's a difference between being a daydreamer and a dreamer. A daydreamer dreams big but floats around life, drifting from job to job, from relationship to relationship, from the good to the good, but never actually sitting and appreciating the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, a dreamer, a dreamer dreams with purpose, knows there's a why, has a goal, a vision. They also appreciate there's a windy path to get there, but they constantly keep their eyes on the horizon. Some people stay daydreamers for life and that's okay. Others don't know how to dream at all. So it's not all bad being a daydreamer because all you need is that one moment to see the dreams through a different lens. Mine came from my life partner, my best friend and the person that makes me better, my wife Ellie. Now I've been daydreaming about doing some extra study. I was looking for a new challenge, so I thought, why not do the thing that I wasn't great at again? Why not have a crack at the thing that I'd failed multiple times at again? So I put my hat in the ring to study an MBA. And then me being me, I pulled out. I pulled out because the story I was telling myself was that my past marks were not good enough. I didn't have enough experience. And I should bide my time a little more. Then my parents put the final nail in the coffin. And yes, they were trying to protect me from, my fail from failing, like all, the, all good parents do. But they said, look, maybe you shouldn't apply because you probably won't get in. Now, my beautiful wife wouldn't stand for that. And one evening, she whacked down a poem at the kitchen bench that read something like this. When you get when you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what the man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back in the glass. He's the fellow to please and never mind all the rest for he's here with you clear to the end and you've passed your most difficult and dangerous test if the man in the glass is your friend. Now that kicked me into gear and I did apply for that MBA and I did finish it. And yes, I still have plenty of periods of doubt. They creep in, no matter what. And you'll get a few uppercuts in life, you'll get knocked down, you'll get shortchanged, you'll get the rug pulled out from underneath you, you get your heels clipped and your knuckles beaten. And you'll be in a place where you can't see the clearing from the trees. But the one thing that I've learned is that you should never stop dreaming. And if you're dreaming, make sure you dream with purpose. And remember, the story that you're telling yourself is quite often the story that's going to hold you back. Now, Friday the 27th of March, 2020, the toughest day of my career. Four weeks early, it started raining across the eastern states and we'd started to see livestock listings increase to the platform that we'd never experienced before. Three weeks earlier, the World Health Organization declares COVID-19 a pandemic. Scott Morrison responds and introduces the first safety measures. 
Two weeks earlier, the entire team had moved to work remotely. Along with our team moving remotely, so did the entire country. Couple that with the, cool, with the school sending kids home, who no doubtedly spent more time on Netflix than zooming into their classes. On Thursday the 26th of March, the day before Friday, cattle listings had reached a peak of 30,000, our second largest Friday ever. I'd also received a random email from Microsoft, which to be honest, landed in my junk and I would have normally deleted. It read, and I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially said, please be advised that due to the ongoing global pandemic, Microsoft is prioritising essential services and as such, your server bandwidth may be impacted. Of course, we agree with Microsoft's intent. Well, Friday rolls around and the office is buzzing. Phones are going bananas, prices are being ent entered, and genuine happiness is flowing down the line from farmers with full dams. A great way to, to end the week. We rolled through the sales and the system starts to get a little bit shaky. Our dev team flags that we've got over 3,000 people logged into just one of our sales. Then they flag that the other sales running are not far behind for numbers. Bidding's ferocious. At 11am, we get hit with another tidal wave of bidders and the system flexes and eventually starts to buckle under the sheer volume of listings, buyers and bids placed. The Microsoft bandwidth warning is now a reality. They'd essentially taken a 12 inch piece of poly pipe, dropped it down to a quarter inch and we had more water pressure than we've ever had before. An absolute shitstorm. You immediately panic. You either fight, flight, or get stuck. Very normal response mechanisms. That day we fought, the team fought. We focused on what we could control and tried to ignore what we couldn't. The phones lit up, the dev team kicked into overdrive, and we eventually got through. We finished the sales, but not without huge personal and professional bruises. The team was beaten up and so was I. I found myself alone in the boardroom catching my breath and doing what all of us do these days, a bit of mindless social media flicking. And I ended up in one of those YouTube channels around DIY woodworking. <laughs> Suddenly my, 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 my saved videos popped up and fortunate there was the nugget I needed. It was a three minute motivational video that I'd listened to a couple years earlier. It, in it had one of Rocky Balboa's famous quotes. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbow. It's a mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are, it'll beat you to your knees. And, if it, and it'll keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me and nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't how hard you hit. It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. I shared that with the team that night, and I shared it with the team multiple times last year. I also read the quote multiple times myself, probably more than the team. Since that day, and up until now, our team's been in the trenches. We dug deep, and we never let it happen again. Now there's no silver bullet, there's no magic pill, and there's no shortcuts, and it can be a bloody long road. But you just need to grind and work hard. We all know that, but sometimes it's easy to forget. Now noting there is a difference between working to be productive and working to be busy, and this is something that we all have to think about. If you're busy, you're just spinning your wheels and you're more likely to get bogged. But if you're productive, you're actually moving forward along the bumpy road. You're actually grinding it out and you're actually moving forward. And finally, like my grandfather always said, remember, quite often, by working hard in silence, you let the success be a noise. Now, I'm sure we've all had a moment and not the typical moment where you've lost it and you've started screaming at your partner, your family or your kids. That defining moment. We've all had one. 
A, it's a brief experience that jolts us and elevates us and changes us. And research has actually found that that defining moments are create that defining moments are created from one or more of the following three elements. Insight. Defining moments rewire our understanding of ourselves or the world. Pride. Defining moments capture us at our best and moments of achievement and moments of courage. Connection. Defining moments are social. These moments are strengthened when we share with them with others. One of my defining moments was when I realised that I needed to make a career change. I was in a job with my boss who was cons constantly bopping my ideas on the head. Now we've all had that. Hey boss, why don't we try this? Hey, have you thought about that? Why don't you think about this? Could we do it this way differently? Now being young and foolish, after, a couple, after 18 months of that, I thought it was he just didn't like me or he didn't like my ideas. But the penny dropped in one meeting when he said, son, you just need to wait your turn and that's just life. It hit me like a freight train. In that moment, I realised I was the only one in control of my own future. I needed to grab it. So I climbed down my ladder, I picked it up and I put it on another wall. I took a cut in salary, I moved cities and I tried something different. I turned left and started climbing up a new ladder to see if it was a better career path. I also knew that if it was the wrong ladder or it was the wrong wall, I'd climb down the ladder and try a different wall. Now you could have just now I could have just kept playing the short game and sitting in the sweet spot. The short game is one with known players, fixed rules and agreed upon objectives. The one my boss likes to play. In. But I decided to play a long game. One where rules are changeable and infinite with unknown rules and unknown players who are all in it to keep playing. That one moment gave me an entire new mindset and it's one that I live by today. Look long, play short. There's nothing wrong with having a short term mindset if you're playing rugby or soccer or tennis because there's clear rules, there's sidelines. There's known players and at the end of the game there's a winner and a loser. You play it to win and you have that finite mindset. It helps. But the trouble begins when you don't understand the game you're playing and you end up playing with the wrong mindset. Because if you're playing the long game with a short term mindset, not only does it make us suffer, tired, anxious, angry, frustrated, but it actually sabotages progress. progress and success. So don't let those moments pass you by. Suck them in, take control of your own destiny and make the moments matter. Now I've skipped and stum stumbled, danced and walked through the battleground of life. I've been good at it and I've been not so good at it, but ultimately I've loved every minute. And if I had, if I had the chance, I'd do it all again exactly the same. Remember, Dream with purpose. Don't let the story you're telling yourself hold you back. Grind and work hard and take the moments to control your future. Best of luck for the rest of Beef and thank you so much for having me. Thanks Angus, that was great. Some fantastic insights there for everyone. So to keep things moving along, I'd now like to introduce Matt Hood to the stage. Uh, Matt moved from Australia uh, to New Zealand in 2004. Matt currently works for Rabobank um, and along with managing a, a diverse portfolio of bank clients, he has also held leadership roles within the bank's national strategy groups for dairy and farm ownership. Probably the main reason Matt's here with us today, which is great, is, is he really enjoys um, working with people on their um, succession plan 
really utilising his experience, past and present, to help uh, the next generation of farmers um, into their own businesses. So, welcome to the stage, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Now, I hide my mihimai, and a mana, and a reo, and a iwi, and a koto, tenakoto, tenakoto, katoa. So, uh, Locke, thank you very much, and uh, real privilege to be here. Very excited to be here, and uh, you know, the bubble opened literally just in time. So, uh, many thanks to uh, Beef Australia, to Auctions Plus, and everyone else that's uh, helped make this happen. Uh, that was a traditional uh, Maori greeting, which is basically come, welcome, come in. Um, in our mana, we respect your strength. We respect your strength as an individual, as, uh, as a community, as an industry. In our reo, the language we use, and I know it's great being back here, and you'll probably pick up that whilst I've been, I was born here in Australia, I've been in New Zealand since 2004, so um, my, my accent's probably somewhere between the two. But the language we use to communicate with each other about the things that are important to us, the things we love doing, the things that uh, Angus talked about, and just being a bit, you know, a bit vulnerable, a bit open, um, being strong when we need to be. In our iwi, our tribe, our family, the people that mean something to us. And I think as an industry, one of our challenges is to help some of those non-industry stakeholders understand what's important about our industry as a food, food production um, organisation. Interesting, you know, if COVID's done anything for us, it's made food production sexy again, isn't it, really? And we're seeing, fortunately and unfortunately, we're seeing that reflected in land prices and the demand for land in New Zealand. And we're seeing it talking to some of my colleagues here and, and friends around uh, beef we're seeing it reflected in our Australian land prices as well. Fortunately, it's good to see land prices going up. Unfortunately, as we're going to talk about, one of the challenges for younger people getting into farming is uh, that it may present a little bit of a barrier. So the purpose of this session really is just to help our, our next generation of, um, of farmers. Now, I'm, I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking, I saw the brief for this program, and I'm pretty sure it said under 35s. I can see that all of the ladies in the audience are definitely under 35. I'm not so sure about some of the fellas. Hands up if you're over 35. No, don't <laughs> Right, so the purpose of this session is just to, just to share some of my experiences and stories from New Zealand uh, and even from Australia and just help you understand a little bit about where some of the <coughs> options and opportunities might be. As Locke said, you know, I think part of being here, I'm, I'm a member of the Platinum Primary Producers Group, which is an agribusiness group spanning Australia and New Zealand and uh, part of the Zander McDonald Award. And each time we've had a recipient of the Zander McDonald Award, they've been able to travel through Australia and New Zealand, go and visit different members and talk about different things. And I've had the privilege of talking to Emma and also to, uh, to um, Shannon and other Zander McDonald Award recipients. And they just thought, well, some of the things we we're doing in New Zealand and some of the things I was talking about was worth sharing with this for forum and format and maybe just provide a bit of insight and unstick some ideas for people as they're thinking about how they take the next step in farming and farm ownership. So, just a little bit about me. Um, enjoy my fishing. Enjoy my hunting. Enjoy my fishing. Enjoy catching up with mates, shooting the breeze, shooting some clay targets, shooting ducks. Enjoy my fishing. <laughs> Bit of a theme here, right? Yeah. Uh, enjoy my hunting, that's my fierce hunting dog Lulu. Uh, enjoy a bit of motorbiking. And uh, probably if I think about my real purpose, it's my it's my four girls, my wife and my three girls. So Georgie's my oldest in the middle there, she's 19, she's at Canterbury University studying Bachelor of Commerce. Marguerite on the uh, on the right, she's 17, and Amelia's 13 going on 21. It's always the way with the youngest, isn't it? Pretty rubbery and uh, and uh, hard to control, but look, but my real purpose and my why is, is raising kids who want to be connected and involved in the community, who are interested in others and have, a, have an appetite for lifelong learning. So just a bit of a write up around this presentation. Some of the things I'm going to share with you, they're just, they're my observations, right? They're not, nothing to do with the bank's observations, they're just my observations from my, my time in banking and in the rural communities in New Zealand and founded from some of my experiences in Australia. So they're just observations and just some thoughts, maybe just prompt a bit of 
bit of ideas, a few ideas for you. If there's anything that you're really objectionable to, then uh, sing out or call on me later and, um, and let's have a run and talk about it. So, some context. Emma of City Hill recognise that this Castle Point station just out on the east coast of the lower North Island of New Zealand where I'm from. So I thought I'd just start with a bit of a competition, right? New Zealand versus Queensland. How many Queenslanders here? Oh, how many New South Welshmen? Northern Territory? Hey, good, good balance in the audience. So I thought I'd just make it Queensland, so that's good, right? Population, I thought I'd pop cover the important stuff. Populations, sheep and cattle. New Zealand, population, five million. Queensland, population, 5.11 million. Queensland winner. New Zealand, sheep, 27 million. <laughs> Queensland, 1.9 million. New Zealand, winner. Cattle, New Zealand, 3.8 million. Queensland, 12.1 million. And I thought that's probably not entirely fair. I'd better add in the, in the dairy stock. And if you add in dairy, we're about 6.4 million dairy cows in New Zealand. That gives us 10.2 million, which is still short of your 12.2. So I declare Queensland the winner. So a bit of context for you, New Zealand's got about 51,000 um, farm holdings according to Beef and Land New Zealand, averaging about 270 hectares, and 93% of those are sort of their, their owner-operators, they're family-owned and, and run. The Wairapa region where I'm from, Lower North Island, East Coast, uh, there's about 380 sheep and beef farms with an average scale of under 5,000 stock units, I think it's 4,786 or something, equally ridiculous, but we'll talk a little bit about scale and issues and opportunities from that. We'll also talk a bit about those ownership structures and the issues and opportunities for that as well, which may or may not bear some resemblance to your experiences here in New Zealand. So the challenges we see in New Zealand and now in our environment is one of scale. So 5,000 stock units. So a stock unit, just to help you understand, is I think the Lincoln Handbook is 55 kilo U doing 110% uh, weaning. Yeah which is almost ridiculous, right? Because at the moment in New Zealand, I think we've, um, our U-hobbits coming through would be 55 kilos and they're doing probably on average 90% and most of our mixed age U's would be well over that weight and doing 135, 155% uh, survival to sale with lambing. So if you boil it right back and say, so what's a stock unit? Traditionally, it was a mixed age ewe, or a, it's a way of measuring feed intake. So it's about 550 kilos of dry matter consumed per year. So for a mixed age cow, it would be something like six. It would be a six stock unit equivalent. So I know we talk about DSEs and, and other uh, stock classes here, but it might just give you a bit of an idea when we talk about that. A 4,800 stock unit farm would be probably uh, 500 hectares yeah, of sort of rolling medium steep hill country. But that scale comes with some limitations for earning and we'll talk a bit about um, average performers and above average performers and what that looks like in terms of uh, deliverables on the ground and what's left at the bottom for people to reinvest either in capital improvements in the farm, in debt reduction or in growth opportunities. Age and stage, probably not dissimilar to Australia, New Zealand's average age of farmers is approaching 60, sort of 58 to 62. And we're getting to a point where some of those people have been involved in farming all their lives and they're saying, what do we do next? They're, they're struggling a little bit with some of the physical challenges. They're struggling a bit with the technology challenges, the compliance challenges that are coming at them. Environmental, animal markets, communities, a whole range of challenges that they've got coming at them. People and productivity, this might be a little bit, the people piece might be a bit controversial. But in, inherently, we've, as farmers, we've all learnt to manage crops, we've all learned to manage animals and machinery and finances to a degree. But one of the things we've often struggled with as an industry as a whole is how we manage people and especially young people coming through the industry. So how do we, you know, one of the focus areas is how do we help some of these uh, retiring farmers uh, partner up with younger people in a more meaningful way rather than sort of almost pushing them out of the industry by being a bit fixed in our views. Uh, productivity, interesting for, you know, if I think about New Zealand, in 1990, according to Beef and Land New Zealand, we had about 58 million sheep, and we produced, uh, I can't remember exactly what the number was, it doesn't matter, but in 1990, 50, 58, 58 million sheep, 2019, 27 million sheep. So if you look at the graph for, for sheep numbers, it's going like this, but if you look at the graph for lamb production, 
it's dropped, I think, 9% in that same time frame. So that's driven the, the importance of that is the level of productivity, innovation, and the sort of relentless work that's gone into improving our productivity uh, in farming. So the average 1990, the average lambs per year was 1.02. In 2019, 1.33 lambs per year. Uh, lamb weight was 13.9 kilos of carcass weight, and in 1990, and now it's 19.1. So the amount of product we're producing through this innovation and work that we've done with breeding and farming systems has changed the, hasn't, the output from a reduced input uh, has, has changed significantly. So then, then we get on to the last piece, this succession piece, is how do we help our farmers? Because one of the things I learned years ago, I was doing some work with Lynn Sykes and others in New South Wales in a program, uh, it was part of the National Heritage Trust funded program for helping uh, farmers be less reliant on, uh, on government support through times of adversity. And it basically involved uh, a natural resource assessment of the farm, physical, financial, people, and a bit of succession stuff. And I was doing a workshop, and it might have been out in Bulaga or something, and we we're talking about succession and the, the older generation sort of moving off the farm. And this old fella said, he's Matt, there's no way I'm moving off the bloody farm. Well, fair enough, I'm not telling you to, I'm just interested. You know, this is a sort of progression that we're normally following. What are your thoughts there? He said, I'm not ready to die yet. It's a bit drastic. What, what do you mean? It's all my mates that have left the farm and they've been dead within sort of five to eight years. And it prompted us to really think about it because effectively what we've got in this succession piece is a group of people who everything that they've done, everything that they are, is who they are is what they've done. And if you take away what they're doing, they tend to lose a little bit of sense of self. So some of what he's saying, or well, a lot, lot of what he's saying is probably dead right, yeah? So we it sort of re changed the way we thought a bit about succession because succession was always about finding um, mum and dad as they left the farm, somewhere to live and something to live on. But we forgot that key piece of something to live for. So what's the purpose? So as we're thinking about the succession piece, we're talking about succeeding roles, but also succeeding some level of ownership over time. And I think it's really cool. We've got um, Alison Larad here who did her Nuffield in Australia on succession. So Alison, just before I move on, just some comments of your observations around succession and some of the, the challenges and insights that you found in your Nuffield. Dead here, I think, okay. Um, so just a show of hands, who here is from a family business? We're trying to work with mum, dad, siblings, that sort of thing. Very nice, all three, that's lovely. Um, I'm from a similar background, so I had the great honour of doing a Nuffield scholarship in 2018 and I travelled around the world at someone else's expense, which is a fabulous opportunity if any of you get the chance, and uh, had a look at succession in many other countries and societies um, and other industries. So, yeah, there's some um, themes that run through and there's some issues around both profitability and personal viability when you're looking and thinking about succession. So keep those two areas in mind. Um, and also, I think, always look for um, outside advice as you're um, going through the process. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Alison. It was interesting when Alison and I were talking in the lead up to this over, over Zoom and Teams, um, I found every time she was talking, I'd, I'd find myself nodding, going, yeah, that's the same issues we've got here. And then I'd noticed when I was talking about some of the issues and insights we've got in New Zealand, I'd find Alison nodding, and what we've both talked about is whether it's Australia or New Zealand or from some of our travels around the world, the issues are the same in farming, is how do we succeed those key roles in farming and how do we um, succeed the ownership of those assets over time in a fair way across family. It's interesting. <laughs> um, I was reminded of a story about how to catch monkeys. Anyone know how to catch monkeys? How they catch monkeys in the jungle? If you imagine this in your own mind's eye, they get a large clay urn with a, a narrow neck and a bowl with space and they fill it full of fruits and nuts and strap it to a tree. You say, that's cool, so what happens? Well, the monkey comes along, can smell and see the fruits and nuts, reaches in, grabs a handful of fruits and nuts, but of course can't get the hand out through the top and they won't let go. So all the hunter has to do is just come along and knock them on the head. And it prompted me to think about you know, some of the fixed views. What are the, view, what are the beliefs and thoughts that we're having that mean that we're hanging on to something that if we let go of, we'd be fundamentally free. So what I want to do is just share a couple of case studies with you now from some, just two of the, um, two of the sort of, not so much succession, but equity partnership arrangements we set up in New Zealand 
in my area. It's only two of a range of them, but I'll just give you a couple of these because I thought they'd be interesting, especially for young people as they're coming into farming. One of them involves somebody with not a lot of capital at all, and the other one involves a, another young couple who had um, somewhat more capital, but they took a slightly different pathway. Oh, I just slotted this in to think about what's the difference between a, high, a top performer and an average performer. So this is some information from Beef and Land New Zealand, and apologies for the way the numbers are. But basically it just talks about um, gross farm revenue produced. So these are in uh, thousands. So the, the average was sort of $967 a hectare. $967 yeah, $967 a hectare versus the high was $1,351 a hectare. So this is all the same farming class. This is I'm focusing on sheep and beef rather than dairy, just I think it's probably got a more comparable fit for, for this audience. Farm operating expenditure, 517 or 53% for the average, and 579 or 43% for the higher producers. I looked at debt servicing and said, well, if they had um, $5 million uh, of debt, and this is for a 10,000 stock unit property, right? It's just a model we put together using the beef and land data. For 10,000 stock units, make it easy, because you can divide it any which way. But basically, that was um, at 4%. So it's 21% interest charges or 15% for the top producers. The farm profit before tax, $250 a hectare versus 572. Take some tax and some drawings from mum and dad out of that, and you're left with 80,000 and 312,000. You sell 80,000, still pretty good, right? But what's the difference when you start thinking about what's the value of a top operator here? What's the value of somebody who can make more out of the same resources than somebody else? What does it deliver for people in the bottom line? What this part of this and the bottom piece of that is where I added in, uh, say, an increased debt servicing. So I think we used 4% on that, which is still high at the moment, but I put interest charges up to, say, so status more of long term sort of status quo point, and all of a sudden you look at the average and they're bleeding $10,000 a, uh, sorry, $10 a, a hectare per year, right? Cool. So the sensitivity of interest charges is quite high, whereas the other business as a high performer still has plenty of latitude for reinvestment in infrastructure, people, animals, genetics, off-farm investments, debt reduction. So I, just, I threw that in just to give you a bit of an idea as we go into a workshop later on today and start thinking about what are the aspects, what are the key drivers and the, the attributes of a top operator because that's how they manifest in businesses in New Zealand. Right, so case study one, this is an interesting one. It's a young couple, uh, both of them grew up on uh, farming, different farming families, got married. Um, he was working for a, a large scale sheep and beef farmer out on the coast, and she was working as an extension specialist with one of our industry organisations in Masterton. And the farmer they were working for was looking for a way to sort of get out of the front line of farming because he was looking at taking on some industry roles and he wanted somebody who was going to look after, look after the place and care for it like he would. So they thought the only way to, to do that was to give the young, the young couple some ownership in this business. But the young couple never thought they'd be able to do this, right? Because it was a 16,000, 18,000 stock unit business, a reasonably large scale business. And uh, they said, look, we've only, I won't use their numbers, I'll just use round numbers. They said, well, look, we've only got about 50,000 of cash. How could we, how could we take a 25% shareholding? in a 16,000 stock unit business. So we, and, the, and the farmer was saying, well, we're prepared to help you with some form of guarantee. Because it's important to me to pursue my industry roles, it's important to me to have some stakeholders in this business that, uh, that are as wired for it and as committed to it as what we are. And we started thinking about structure. So I should have gone back to, let's go back to here, because one, one of the key aspects I didn't talk about was structure. For most of our sheep and beef farms in New Zealand, certainly in our area, they have a land owning trust and an operating company, like a mum and dad company, 50-50 owned, or a partnership or a sole trader. Yeah? So that, that operating entity owns all the livestock and plant and equipment and leases the land from the trust. What's important about that for this particular business was these people, these young couple were only taking, an, were looking to take an equity position in the trading entity, in the company that owned livestock and plant and equipment. So the problems were, how do we help the farmer get out of the front facing piece where he's still going to have an involvement in the business but he's not going to be the key man on the ground every day managing staff and all of the complexity and uh, other things that went, go on with the farming business. And for the young couple, how do they 
take an ownership role in a business where they've only got 50,000 of cash. Their aspirations were to get into some level of farm ownership and to grow their equity through that pathway. So basically what we did, if you work with this, there's your landowner trust in green. What's that? And there's Farmco, which is the operating company that owns livestock, plant and equipment. The current owners were the trustees and beneficiaries of the trust, but they're also the shareholders and directors of Farmco. So we worked out a way for them to sell 25% of their shares in the farming company to the equity managers. Now, for them to take a 25% shareholding, they needed about $550,000. Oh, wrong way. Because you can see the assets of the trust, the assets of the company, 2.7 million, had 500k of bank debt, so there's 2.2 million of equity. Then, so we lent them 500,000. And the question you might ask is, how do you lend somebody with 50,000 dollars, 500,000? How do you do that? And if you think about what the bank's looking for, is it's a bit like the three-legged stool. You're looking for a level of security. You're looking for a high degree of personal factor, and you're looking for a viability piece to demonstrate that they can service their debt. One of the key things with this piece was um, the wife. The wife's family uh, already banked with us and we had security over land. This business already banked with us and we had security over land from the trust and a guarantee from the trust of the company. They were good quality people, they were known. She was working off farm, he was drawing a salary, age and stage, no kids. So uh, there are no big demands on household income. So they could service debt, they could comfortably service $500,000 of debt, no problem at all. Yeah. The other key piece of this is, so we were able to secure it with some limited guarantees. So her parents provided a limited guarantee in favour of that borrowings and the company provided a limited guarantee in favour of those borrowings. The other key piece of this is it's a large scale business that had quite low debt, it was lowly geared. And it had a, a demonstrable history of viability, strong viability. So the dividends that were falling out of that business were gonna go towards debt reduction, which was part of their equity growth pathway when they thought about because you know, livestock and plant and equipment, plant and equipment tends to depreciate and livestock can go up and down depending on the, the markets and the season, yeah? So they knew there was gonna be some volatility in the assets. So their key driver for reduce, for growing equity was a one-to-one -one by reducing debt, but it was a bona fide way of doing it. So we structured it, they bought 25% shareholding in Farmco. So we're able to overcome that capital, that capital piece where they only had 50,000 with good level of security, strong, measurable personal factor. These people have been working, both coming from strong farming family backgrounds, they've been working in this business, as in, well, he had for three years as an employee, she was off farm as an extension specialist. And we knew who we were dealing with and what the quality of the people were. We knew that the fundamentals of the business were strong and they can service and repay the debt. Interestingly, so that was 2014 that started and with, they're just winding their way out of that company now and they're taking the learnings from how we went into the process of an equity partnership. Because what tends to happen, this is the other observation, equity partnerships are not unusual, right? When you think about the structure I mentioned before, the trust in the farming company. Sometimes when we're talking to farmers about uh, what are you gonna do next, what about uh, equity partnership? No, never go into an equity partnership. What about leasing the farm? Ah, no way, never lease the farm. Guess what they're in? Company structure, mum and dad. 50-50 ownership. If you don't think they're in an equity partnership, watch what, watch what happens when they separate, right? That's a little bit flippant, but that's the reality of it. If you don't think you are, um, you'll get a bit of big surprise. They're already leasing the farm. Yes, they're leasing it from, the, from themselves, but the structure is already there. All of a sudden, you know, that, that monkey piece, you know, all of a sudden they go, oh my God, we're already in an equity partnership. We've already got a company structure where we can buy and sell shares in the company. We've already got a lease agreement. Okay, it's not arm's length. What we notice with these family arrangements is a lot of the agreements, the really important agreements about what are our roles, what are our responsibilities, how are we gonna measure success, what's the business plan, what are the key objectives, they're all implied. They're all implied, they've never really had that robust conversation. When we're pulling equity partnerships together with unrelated parties, what do you think happens with those conversations? They're all explicit. Right? and they're all documented in detail. How are we gonna value the business on the way in? How are we gonna value the business on the way out to ascertain values of shares? What are our roles? How are we gonna be held accountable for those? What are the key measurables and deliverables? All that stuff's explicit. So if, you, if you're in a family business and you're finding yourself thinking, yeah, maybe some of our stuff's implied and it's not explicit. Not too late, like planting a tree, you know? Best time was 10 years ago, next best time today. So they're winding their way out of this business now using the same, the same agreed process that they went into it because 
they're taking the capital out. That capital's grown from 50,000 to probably 750,000 and they're putting it into an equity partnership with their family and using some of those same disciplines for a larger scale property where they now have ownership in land, livestock and plant equipment. Now it's just a really exciting story for these young couple who came with 50K 50, 50 in 2014 to 2021 where they're now taking an opportunity with wider family to grow what's a reasonably large business already with a high quality uh, breeding and finishing property that's going to be theirs. So it was, uh, it's just an interesting story and I'm happy to take questions on that later. Second one, um, this is a dairy one. Young couple, the guy lived next door to me, managed the farm next door for friends of ours and he took the farm from 210,000 kilos of milk solids, which is a measure of production, to I think 380 odd thousand kilos of milk solids in the three or four years that he was there. That same family owned a property in the South Island. He went down there, it was a 500,000 kilo dairy farm with all of the complexity that that sort of level of scale and technology and people management requires and he proved himself over two or three years down there to be a really capable operator. You know, in the dairy industry, he was operating as a contract milker, so he was receiving $1.30 a kilo for all the kilos it produced, but he had some costs to go with that as well. But they were able to accumulate an amount of capital, let's call it 400000 for argument's sake. The next step in the industry going from contract milkers would be to go to like a 50-50 share milker where they own the herd and plant and equipment and they took 50% of the milk check and the farm owner took the other 50% of the milk check, they'd normally have about 55% of the cost and the farm owner would have 45% of the cost, right? So they'd buy a herd. Now if they took their 400,000 and leveraged themselves to the eyeballs with debt, what scale of business do you think they'd be able to own? as a 50-50 share milker compared to the 500,000 kilos that they're managing. It's about half or less, right? They would have struggled to have owned enough with debt to their eyeballs, they'd struggle to have owned enough to do uh, to, to operate as a 50-50 on the 200,000 kilo farm. This is a normal pathway in New Zealand, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with it, plenty of people have made an enormous amount of money. But here's a guy, young guy, young family, three young kids. His opportunity was to go 50-50 and he was about to do it. And I've been pulling together this equity partnership with a group of other people who were really excited about this farm because it was a development opportunity, they were capitalists and they was going to play to their strengths. And they said, look, we'll only do this if we can find a top operator. We want somebody who can come in here and really make this thing hum. So we introduced the parties and they started talking. And all of a sudden, this young fella's going, gee, this is my pathway, right? My pathway is to go from managing half a million kilo business to 50-50 with a whole heap of debt and be about 200,000 kilos. And what would normally happen in a 50-50 role, you'd be three to six to nine years. They normally go in those three year increments. And then they'd, um, they'd reduce debt over that time and they'd get to this point and they go, okay, now I'm gonna buy a farm. What scale of farm do you think they'd be buying? About half again, right? So here's somebody who nine, or, nine to 10 years ago was managing half a million kilos with all of the complexity, the, the people and all that sort of stuff bringing young people through and training them up and getting a bit of fire in their eyes and moving them through into their own roles in the industry, who in nine years' time now got debt to the eyeballs and he's managing, he owns maybe 120, 150,000 kilo business with all of the risks that are associated with high levels, levels of debt and volatility in the industry. And he and his wife looked at that pathway and thought, that's a good pathway, that's the one we're gonna follow. But we're prepared to let go of that because we'd like we see more value in having a small part of something big than a big part of something small over time. So they took, they took their 400,000 plus, I think we lent them 900 odd thousand, and they took a 10 to 11 percent share in this new company that basically uh, it was a limited, limited liability partnership. But it owned uh, 350 hectares of dairy land, it owned uh, all the dairy cows, Fonterra shares, livestock, you know, plant equipment, the whole nine yards. So he took a 10% share in that. The existing, the original owner of that farm in Green there, the Trading Trust, he was a friend of mine and he was struggling a little bit just to keep, to keep abreast of things. He, by his own admission, he wasn't a dairy farmer and he was looking for ways to get out and he said, and that's what sort of prompted this whole thing. So he sold the 350 of his 480 hectares into that business and he had a 35% shareholding. He loves the development piece and he's very, very good at it, but he's not good at the dairy farming piece. He, doesn't, he didn't like the HR piece, the human resources piece that came with a scalable business. So this business, the best that it had ever done under his original ownership was 285,000 kilos. Year one, they did uh, 380, 385,000 kilos. Year two, they did 408. Year three, 427,000 kilos. Last year, they did 605,500 kilos. 
So here's a business that's just grown astronomically in that period of time. You say, right, so why is he a top operator? Why is this young fella a good top operator? He's, he's growing more grass, eating more grass at a higher ME than anyone else, using the same or less resources. His, his efficiency factors are really, really strong. His attention to detail, his ability to manage people and complexity, really, really strong. A bit like the other couple. You know, so they're bringing this level of capability from large-scale businesses um, and applying some ownership to that and growing businesses and growing with people. So it was a really interesting choice that, uh, that they made around that. And to see him last year or this year just gone, he just increased his shareholding by another, uh, I think, 14%. So he was able to buy some shares from one of the other shareholders and they issued some more shares in the company. So he's increased his shareholding again now and this business is growing. Um, this one, a bit like the first one, what I ne neglected to say with the first one, this is really interesting. And sorry to jump around a little bit here. But what happened, I think four months after we settled this, after the, the young couple bought a 25% shareholding in, in the farming company, that land owning trust bought another farm. So it went from 16 or 18,000 stock units to over 20,000 stock units. So the liability for purchasing stock and everything sat in that farm co-business, which it was able to do because it was lowly geared. So here's this young couple who thought they were buying into a 16,000 16, stock unit business. It was always, all of a sudden, over 20,000 stock units. Similarly with the, um, with the dairy business, they had 350 hectares of owned land. They were leasing some land and then an opportunity came up, I think two years into this, to buy 100 hectares next door within two paddocks of the cow shed which was a part of the contributor to the increase in, in production, but the fundamentals of efficiency were still there. So it shows the value of having a relatively low level of gearing within the, within the main business. And if I offered you one rule, one insight out of this, is you can have one business highly geared, but, but not both. So the equity manager, really highly geared. You know, they 400,000 of cash and they borrow 950. 50,000 of cash and they borrow 500. They're relatively highly geared, yeah? but the, the main business is not, which gives it flexibility and opportunity for, for growth and for delivering results for businesses at the bottom. Uh, I've covered most of that, what's important, what happened, um, what works. What works is those really strong, robust conversations with yourself and with those people that you want to go into business with. It's really difficult with family, and uh, I've been there, we, I came from a family farming background, I understand what that's like. It's difficult with family because you have all those patterns of behaviour. You know, you want to say something to dad and you start to say it and you get that look and you just stop, right? Or you say something to mum and then she something, says something to dad and dad's not talking to you for a week. It's like, God, you know, come on. <laughs> the family stuff is tough, but it's not insurmountable. And I think as um, Alison said, you know, get some help around that. Because if you want to do anything from here, because I think most people, how many people in family businesses? Cool, really cool. If you want to do something from here, think about what are the conversations and agreements we need to strike with each other if we're going to be explicit about what we're trying to achieve, what our roles are, and how we're going to go about doing that, and how we're going to measure it. Key lessons. Key lessons out of this. Young people coming into industry oftentimes have had experiences that are different. You know, those two examples I gave, ooh, went too far have had experiences in larger scale businesses where they can bring those skills back to a smaller business, uh, especially a family business. How do you do it? How do you do it in a constructive way? Young people can be solution providers for people who are looking to exit the industry over time. You know, so they can, the succession piece can be the succession of the key roles, not necessarily the ownership of the business in, in part or in whole, but it can be the succession of roles. The people capital piece is critical, your ability to manage relationships. Understand, I think, as Angus was saying, uh, you do a bit of a deep dive into yourself and understand, well, who am I? You know, the, the mirror, mirror on the wall piece. What am I good at? What am I not good at? What do I need to be good at? Um, what can I get other people to do that they might be better at it than me? John, what I call the John Palmer principle. John Palmer was the New Zealand chairman of the year, three out of four years in a row or something. I was facilitating a meeting in Nelson, and uh, one of our friends was there. John had just finished speaking, and he said, oh, John, um, question time. Uh, what's... What's the silver bullet? How do you, I'd just love to emulate some of what you've achieved in, in your career. How would, I, what, how would I do that? What would you suggest? And he said, great question. He said, the, he said, the best thing I could say to you is don't let your ego get in the way of a good decision. 
And everyone, ah, silver bullet, and they're tucking this ego thing away in their pocket. I said, John, just help us understand what you mean by that. He said, Matt, it's like this. My role in these businesses is to make sure we're employing people who are far smarter than what I am to do the jobs we're asking them to do. Because if we don't, the business will only ever go as fast as me, and I'm not that good. And I thought that was really humble, right? That was a really, really humble thing for him to say. And all of a sudden, you could feel the liberty in the room, because these people are going, wow, when in our whole farm owning career, in our farm business career, when have we ever sought to employ somebody who's far smarter than us to do the jobs we're asking them to do? And there's an opportunity in there when we think about that and we think about some of these young people who are looking for ways into the industry for us to sort of let go of some of the thoughts and beliefs we've got and employ these people and find a relationship where they can learn from us and we can learn from them. Robust discussion, written agreements. You know, you, uh, you, Angus was talking about dreams, right? What's the difference between a dream and a goal? It's when you write it down, when you verbalise it, when you commit it to people. Clear and measurable plans, regular forum for discussions, debate and decision making, their relationships, because it's the process of relating, and we don't always get it right. There are arguments, there's debates, but it's always you, know, you let the head clash and not the hearts because you've got a robust process in there to do it. Again, for family businesses, difficult because most of those conversations are had around the family table where we're having dinner as well. You know, so find some disciplines to get, get those business discussions maybe out of the house with uh, somewhere else and with, uh, with other people who can help you navigate your way through the emotive part of some of that decision making. Larger scale, this is one of the, and this is one of the key secrets, right? Larger scale, well geared, so not too much debt, enough to get you out of bed in the morning but not keep you awake at night. High performing, well governed, and really, really well managed. You know, empowering people to have that sort of growth mindset to make mistakes. A good mate of mine, Doug Avery, learned from his son Richard, who's in Western Australia trading grain, who had a few whoopsies, and he said, Dad, you know what I've learned? He said, It's not a case of win or lose. He said, I either win or I learn. And Doug said, My God, I wish I'd known, I wish I'd learned that 20 years ago. Because this whole fear of not winning was preventing him from doing stuff that he could have done because he didn't want to be seen as a failure, he didn't want to, he didn't want to um, lose. But all of a sudden he said, well, okay, here's a different mindset, right? Here's a different opportunity. You either win or you learn. We make mistakes. It's, it's part of who we are. And I think Angus, you were very humble in opening up and, and talking about some of the mistakes you've made. We've, we've all made them, right? But um, it's how we learn from them. And have that growth mindset, that relentless um, desire to learn and to grow with others. So some of the, these are some of the things we've learned from these uh, these little equity partnerships. How are we going for time, please? <coughs> Five minutes. Five minutes? Cool. All right. So be clear, be honest with yourself, be honest with others, and ask for help. What's important? Oh, wrong button. Couldn't resist. <laughs> Sorry. And if somebody's going to ask, right, but my heart's in Australia, but my sort of head's in New Zealand at the moment, until the Wallabies can sort themselves out, I think we're going to be on a hiding to nothing, sadly. But, uh, <laughs> I will celebrate the day when we knock off, when we get that Bledisloe Cup back in Australia. What's important? Your why. Angus, you talked a little bit about it. Anyone seen Simon Sinek's little video on why on YouTube? Anyone seen that? Yeah. Simon Sinek, you've all got a little booklet there. Write it down, S-I-N-E-K, Simon Sinek, why? You've seen Stephen Covey's three circles of control, influence, and concern? Yeah. You imagine three circles, a small one in the middle, a bigger one around the outside, and an even bigger one around the outside. The principles that are, there's a small amount of stuff in our day-to-day -day lives we can control. The next circle is that there's more stuff that we can have some influence over, and there's a whole heap of stuff in that last circle that we can only ever be con concerned about, yeah? Control, influence, and concern. That's the Stephen Covey model. Most people I see when they're under stress, what are they worrying about? all the stuff they can only be concerned about, yeah? And I think, Angus, you talked about control the controllables, and that's one of the secrets of these young people as they come into businesses and bring those disciplines of being really focused and controlling the controllables. The Simon Sinek piece talks a little bit, uses the same model, but he said what happens is we, as, as humans, we start, and we start talking from the outside in, so he talks about the what, uh, the what, the how, and the why. As an industry, and this is one of the traps we fall into in New Zealand, as an industry, we get challenged by environmentalists and others about some of the things we're doing, and we start talking about what we do, and we talk about how we do it. We never, we very rarely ever talk about why we do it. What is the deep-rooted set of beliefs and purpose that we have? I've never, never met a farmer yet that wants to leave the land or the animals worse than they found them. 
I've never met a farmer or, or farm family yet who hasn't wanted to leave the community better than when they found it. But we've got some really strong whys, why we want to be involved in this industry, why we want to be successful, why we want to help others. But we tend to, we tend to communicate a lot from the outside rather than from the inside. So linking to Angus's presentation, I think if you can think about your, what's my why in the business? What's our why as a family? What's our why as an industry? What are we trying to achieve here? And link back some of the things we're doing to that. Your aspirations, be really clear about what they are. Your reality, it's a bit of a reality check, right? So and again, Angus talked about that sort of mirror piece. Who am I? What am I good at? What am I not good at? How do I address some of those things? What are some of the challenges that are likely to be ahead of us? How do we prepare for those? Make it personal and, and develop, your, develop a plan around it. And have that plan forward. The key thing is once you've got that plan in your head and you start writing it down, is socialise it with others. Start talking to people about it. Interesting for Emma and Shannon with Black Box. How proud are we of, um, of our two Zander Award recipients who what, um, won the, uh, what do they call the Where's Shannon? Pitch in the paddock, pitch in the paddock. You won the pitch in the paddock yesterday, $10,000. Yeah, they gave me the check, right? Because I'm a banker. <laughs> but uh, you know, how proud are we of, of them when they, uh, when they talked about their plan and how they started to put that in action, but also some of the things that they've had to change along the way because it's a moving feast. Stuff's changing all the time, right? But they're flexible and they're thinking about it and they've got the right people around them, helping them do the stuff that they're not good at or they don't know how to do. So you, what's important is having your why being really clear about that and those two young couples, they were clear in what they wanted to achieve in the industry. They were open about their aspirations, they were clear about and honest about their reality and where their weaknesses were and where their strengths were and how they could play to them and they had a plan and they helped other people with a plan and fundamentally they've actually, in helping other people, they've helped themselves. So just in closing, quick question, I always hate when presenters do this sort of stuff, right? Quick question. Six frogs sitting on a log. Five decide to jump off. How many frogs are left sitting on the log? Why? Sorry? Yeah. You saw my presentation, the cheeky bugger. <laughs> yeah, six, right? Because the difference between deciding to do something and actually doing it is fundamental. Yeah. So if I can... You know, if you've been writing any notes down from today or you've got some thoughts in your mind as we transition between speakers, just start writing some of those things down, the things that you want to do, questions you want to ask, people you want to engage with, and how you want to start moving forward because you can decide to do it, but you've really got to make it happen. And if you know somebody who's decided to do something that maybe needs a little bit of help doing it, get in beside them because one of the best ways to help yourself, help others. So if we've got a minute, any questions, I can take those now or we can cover them. We'll do them later, all right. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, and to, um, to Auctions Plus and Beef Australia, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and engage with you on this session. I hope there was a little bit in there for, for each of you, some thoughts for you to think about, some points to ponder and maybe some actions to take away. But they're just a couple of stories of things that we've done in New Zealand with people who wanted to make a difference in the industry who were capital constrained, but who had a large degree of capability that could help themselves and help others. So thank you very much to, uh, to the sponsors for this session and for, for Beef Australia again. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. That certainly uh, got the brain cogs ticking over on a few you know, a few options and how you can get into your own business and also thinking about the why, why you do stuff. So to keep things moving along, I'd now like to introduce uh, Bristow Hughes to the stage. Along with his wife and children, um, Bristow manages Strath Strathbrailin, is that right? Strathalbin. Strathalbin aggregation, which is a 130,000 acre breeder operation running 8,000 Wagyu cross breeders plus replacement heifers um, on the Burdekin River, about 60 kilometres south of Air. So dry times and staff shortages saw him return to the family business in 2014. As a head stockman for a year before moving to his current property as the manager in 2015, all at the age of 21, I believe. Is that right? 
Right, eh? Let's all welcome Bruce Day. Oh, brutal. I uh, thought I was going to get a feel like a, like a comedian, you know, and walk around and be really loose and free and let my uh, feet are locked in their position and I can feel a little bit of pee coming off. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, thank you very much to Beef Australian Options Plus for having me. Um, let's see how this goes. Hang on. That's close to There we go. Alright. Those are the few things that I was going to touch on. Um, my background, staff recruitment and retention. Obviously, uh, pretty hard to run a business without, um, without good staff. And, and being able to keep them on, uh, so obviously a big part of that is the culture that you have, the work culture that you have. Uh, touch a little bit on land development and uh, what we've done in Strathalbyn and, and uh, how we've improved the, um, well, how we are looking after land and, and the current capacity of that and the herd diversification moving from a well, Brahmin based breeder herd to, to Wagyu. So this is uh, Wentworth Cattle Company's vision and mission. To realise satisfaction in our business, a vibrant environment that stimulates and supports individual and business growth, while contributing to a healthy rural sector and local community. Our mission, we are a generational family owned multifaceted agricultural business focusing on polygenetics and our premium wagyu herd, engaging in innovation and regenerative resource management. So both of those things, um, when we do, when we get new staff, we do a uh, induction, and that's the first thing, first thing we go through with them, so that they understand, um, you know, sort of what we want to do and how we want to be doing it. Uh, my journey from uh, being born to today. Thanks, mum and dad, for that. That was good. Um, <laughs> school wasn't a highlight. It tends to be a bit of a theme here today. Uh, I'm pleased to see that um, Angus also wasn't a fan. I, uh, I didn't challenge myself and go to university afterwards though, because that uh, after the four skills that I went to, they didn't really like me all that much, and I didn't think that the university would appreciate it either. So. Um, but mandatory furthering education, so thankfully my parents were extremely forward thinking in, uh, in everything they did. Um, and I attended my first GFP at six months old, and uh, Got a lot out of that. Um, and then also did a lot of um, low stress dog handling skills from, from quite young as well. So it was always good that they uh, included, included me in, um, in all that furthering education. But their, their one rule for me when I finished school was that I had to go away and work for somebody else uh, for at least a few years or go to university. So off to work I went and I went to um, Lake Nash Station in the Territory and I worked there for a year and then I went to uh, Longton as, uh, as head stockman for six months and then went to Canada. And the plan was to go to Canada for two years. Thankfully my mother's Canadian so dual citizenship, didn't have to worry about a work visa or anything like that. But um, I was over there for about eight months and it was minus 40 degrees for the month of December and I thought this isn't much fun um, anyway and it got to minus seven I think and I was walking around in a t-shirt and jeans and I was like no nah, this is it I've got to go home and uh, anyway I was talking to mum and dad and it was dry and staff was short and they were going to pay for my plane ticket so it was ideal uh, anyway got on and out uh, and yeah went uh, went home and, and got a bit of a crew together and, and uh, was yeah doing all the mustering and everything on Strathalbyn and Wentworth their two main places for the year. Um, they did want me to go to Marcus Island after I'd sorted my life out a little bit, but anyway, I met a beautiful woman and uh, decided to have kids instead. So here we are. But uh, I did I did get to go to uh, a grazing for profit in 2015 before I moved to Strathalbyn. And, uh, and that was oh, a huge reason of, of uh, why I wanted to go to Strathalbyn and, and, uh, and take on that challenge and, and try and improve, improve that part of their business. It, um, resource Consulting Services uh, 
amazing. I can't, um, I can't recommend them highly enough. With uh, the Grazing for Profit and the Executive Link uh, system as well, over three years, um, it was massive for my development, but also my wife. She, um, she hadn't really been involved in business much at all, and and um, it was, yeah, hard, hard thing for her to sort of want to grasp, I suppose. But that was a, yeah, big life-changing thing for her. And then uh, North Queensland Dry Tropics, we've, they did a lot of uh, furthering education, uh, like as far as, you know, resource management and, and um, mastering communications and that sort of thing, which, which helped a lot with um, my uh, being able to interact with staff and, and um, talk to them without coming across the wrong way, which sometimes does happen. Uh, and grazing naturally, Dick Richardson, um, that was sort of the next step in our grazing journey, going from the resource consulting services, uh, rotational grazing sort of system to the more intensive um, holistic management. And um, anyway, and then learning from my own mistakes, which is what I got to do a lot of when I moved to Strathdale, my mum and dad sort of uh, were really good at letting me make my own mistakes. We're running water uphill, I decided I was going to use a head of tank to run water 2k away, whatever, and anyway, set it all up, it's all in, ready to go, turn the tap on, no water. Must have an airlock. So I went along, drilling holes, trying to find this airlock, couldn't find it, Dad come up. But like I used a GPS and it was supposed to be lower. Anyway, Dad came up, we got the dumpy level out and a metre and a half high. Anyway, luckily I only had to extend another hundred metres to make it higher than the original header tank and, and it all worked out in the end, but um, Dad's never let me live that long. Yeah. So this is my family, uh, the Strathalbyn Station sign, we had a Christmas um, theme and uh, we're fortunately the winners of that uh, contest. Uh, Broly, Archie of the Crocodile, stay cool on his shirt, you don't get much cooler than that, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, and we've also got a uh, little girl, Elby, but she um, didn't have many photos of her on my phone at the time. So, staff recruitment and retention. Uh, exciting, fun field learning environment. So, um, I always try to keep everything in the workplace lighthearted, and uh, it seems to have paid off in that, um, you know, the staff that we do have uh, always appear to be you know, happy to be there and and, um, and fun to be around. And we always send, well, try to send everyone to a low stress stock healing school and a, and a horse school. Each, um, I think, Daddy, you tell me to breathe and slow down. Am I talking too fast? Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, and a horse school, and they both, uh, you know, do cost a little bit of money, but they um, the return on investment is is massive because the people really appreciate it, and uh, certainly the cattle and horses appreciate uh, the people getting that education as well. Um, so, by having that good environment, working environment, and um, training people, and and really, you know, trying to continue their education, all of a sudden, instead of uh, having to be constantly putting it out looking for people you get uh, recommendations and um, you get people start to ring you looking for a job, which is um, which is pretty good. And when you hear, when they say, oh, you know, such and such work for you, and they said it was a really good place to work, so I'd like to come work there, it's, uh, it's pretty rewarding. Um, and always showing, showing the staff that you value them, whether that be by, you know, a pat on the back or my thing is to give them a beer in the afternoon. I didn't realise, look, mum and dad always did that. I didn't realise how much it meant until I went to Lake Nash and that wasn't um, done. They had a rec club and you had to buy your own beer and you know, you're sort of walk, working from four in the morning until seven at night and it just wasn't, apart from the paycheck you were getting, there wasn't any, um, you didn't feel valued there, I didn't think. Um, communication's a big one. Obviously, uh, you know, always keeping them informed on, on what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, like with any of the development that we're doing, I always um, say, oh, well, you know, we're fencing this paddock in half because 
they're not using this half and they're you know, over-utilising that half or whatever, they're going to run water out here because of this and because of that. And I think uh, instead of just telling them to go and do it, if you explain the why, they, um, they you know, do it a lot happier. Um, amenities, we spent quite a lot of money on, on renovations to make the staff amenities good. You know, it's um, pretty hard to get people to look after your living areas when you don't appear to look after them yourself in that you're letting them fall down around their ears. So, uh, well, yeah, I found once we've, um, you know, redone the kitchen and, and done the floors in the rooms and new cupboards and that sort of thing, the, they looked after the whole house a lot better. They started to get a lawn going around the outside of it. They started to take a lot of pride in, in where they were living, um, which was good for us. Um, and then extracurricular activities. So, um, we had a big cooler at home, decided to put a cutout yard off the bottom of it. Cost us next to nothing, but then they've got something to do in the afternoons that they enjoy and, and um, I also enjoy. And, um, well, obviously we're on the Burdekin River, so they can go fishing, got a boat there, or um, got my helicopter license at the start of last year, so go for a few fishing trips every now and then. They really appreciate that. Uh, but anyway, I thought it was a bit um, ironic for me to come up here and tell you how good I am and, and um, what the, how, why the staff love working there without actually asking them. So I uh, sent them all a, a message on Monday morning and said, oh, look, uh, I've got to do this talk. Can you just please send me five quick things of why you like working here? Um, and so I've got a few here. Uh, Harry Casey, so he um, was actually working civil driving rollers and uh, his dad was a builder that was working, uh, doing renovations for us at the time. And he rang and asked if I'd uh, give Harry a job because he liked the culture of the workplace and, and that sort of thing and thought Harry really enjoyed it anyway. And so he came with absolutely no experience at all. And now, um, yeah, he's here for his second year, loves riding horses, loves uh, working cattle. It's um, been a real life changer for him and, and for us to have him on board. Um, but anyway, Harry believes that the company providing skills for both horses and cattle take time to show me how to do jobs better. They show appreciation for work completed, getting comments on how well I progress after coming from the civil industry. Dave Halstead, uh, managing Tabletop for us, which is the part of the 130,000 acres. Um, professionalism in the way things are run, the way the land is managed, the way the cattle are managed and handled, the professional development offered to staff, and family values that atmosphere of being a part of Wentworth Cattle Company. So all things that make our business better, and um, and make the land better is the things that the staff really enjoy about being there. So if we can um, take anything away from that, it's that you know people enjoy being part of a progressive business. Um, anyway, I won't go through all of these because it's it's basically the same thing every time. They just really enjoy um, the progressive environment and a relaxed low stress environment I guess would be the low stress on cattle, low stress on people, that's my theory. Um, <laughs> Alright, I didn't touch on, but we, uh, being a part of new trials, um, i.e. virtual fencing, so, you know, as far as Trav goes, he's a good, good young ringer, you know, sort of the head stockman for us this year and and um, it never really occurred to me that that would be something that that made their um, job fun. So uh, anyway, the virtual fencing thing has been really good. We've only, we're only three weeks into this trial, but it's been um, exceptional. I highly recommend it through Agistons. Um But it's just interesting. Um, it was interesting to me to get that feedback that that, that was one of the things that he really liked working. So culture, I've sort of touched on all that, but um, integrity with our environment, our people and our stock. So constantly trying to um, improve our environment and look after it. I know um, Matt touched on, you know, never met anyone that doesn't want to leave the country in a better position than, than the way they found it. Um, but not only do I enjoy doing that and the business benefits from that, but the people enjoy that, um, enjoy that as well. So, um, leading by example, innovation and do as I do. 
the it was a funny one when we were buying the tabletop that we were over there doing the takeover muster and the guy that we were buying it from said, oh, how do you get your young fellas to wear a helmet when you must be like a two-wheeler? I said, I wear one. He said, oh, I'll be buggered, you know, I'm, I'm not wearing that, it's too bloody hot, and I can't get my fellas to wear one, though. And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> how can you expect them to want to wear one if you won't, uh, you won't do it yourself? So, um, and the way you present yourself, you know, um, we had a head stockman last year who used to turn up with his shirt untucked and, and that sort of thing, and then all of a sudden the fellas under him started showing up with their shirt untucked, and that's, you know, not something that I appreciate. So, um, chipped him, made him tuck his shirt in, like, cause I always turn up like that anyway. And then um, all of a sudden, his, uh, the men under him started tucking their shirt in as well without having to have a chat to them. Um, so, yeah, leading, leading by example is, is a big one, I think. And, and um, one, one that's also stuck with me that we learned at GFP is, having a high energy. So when you turn up at the shed in the morning at six o'clock, if you get in there and, good morning, how are you, you know, what's been going on? They, they sort of, all of a sudden go from dragging their feet in because they've just woken up five minutes earlier rather than sleep out their eyes to really gets their energy up as well and, and um, always makes for a better day, I, I think, anyway. Um, and establishing good relationships with clients and service providers. So, um, you know, really long-term, term, term um, relationship with the, uh, with the trucking company that we use, Claremont Livestock Transport. Um, they always do an exceptional job and, and um, will, will put us above other work because we've had that relationship for such a long period of time. And same as their vet, vet they're a multi-generational uh, business as well and, and um, it's really exciting working for them, not only just with preg testing but in any any sort of veterinary work that we need doing, or just um, just a bit of advice, they're always always willing to, to talk to us about it. And um, education centres, so RCS, those sorts of things. Um, I remember two or three years ago, I was going through a pretty tough time. My sister was uh, and her kids had moved in with us for for a period, and and we just had a lot on, a lot of work being done. And um, anyway, for whatever reason, it all got a little bit much. And, well, I hadn't broken down yet, but I was, you know, on the verge of it. And uh, a fellow from RCS rang me and he said, oh, you know, how you going? Just calling for a chat. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, living the dream. And uh, and he goes, you don't sound like you're living the dream. And uh, just because he could pick up in um, in my voice and the way I was talking, he uh, he knew that something wasn't right. Anyway, and I got to get that all off my chest. And... Um, and then I was right again after that. You know, I just had to down, I just had to download it and give it to somebody else for a minute. And um, and it was just good to have that. I don't know connection with that um, business to be able to have that person call at the right time. Uh, so we've got a Facebook page, um, and this is sort of. Just an example of one thing that was put on there. That's a wrap. 4,563 wieners pulled off Marmon process. The steers and cull heifers truck down to Wentworth was a full on fun filled four weeks with a brilliant bunch of people that helped make it all go flawlessly. We'd like to give a huge shout out to the businesses that helped make it all happen. Helicopter mustering was done by the super talented Liam Halstead of Halstead Helicopters. 60 decks of wieners truck by the one and only Ken Dillon and his men from Claremont Livestock Transport and all the cows and cows protested, or cows and heifers protested by the super speedy and accurate Brendan Briefies and Tessa Salmon from Claremont Vets and then Hay came from Lunds and, and um, everything else carted by Edward Walsh, Walsh's Transport which you know it doesn't seem like much but, but all of the guys from Claremont Livestock Transport saw that and um, all, they all rang me and thanked me for writing it and they thought it was, you know, it was really good and, and they shared it and so then their friends see it and um, it was sort of, I don't know, nice, nice to see that, that um, you know, the right people had seen it and they appreciated it and, and it, um, yeah, it made my day anyway and, and they said it made theirs so it doesn't, doesn't take much to make people happy. Uh, so, a bit on the development, Strathalbyn, 2004 when it was purchased to today, so Strathalbyn had 10 paddocks, 3 holding paddocks, 
uh, and uh, 24s or something like that. We had 20, well, pretty much 20 watering points, and um, that photo on the on the right at Strathalbyn today, so that's the top spin added on in, in the bottom corner there, but Strathalbyn sells 67 paddocks. Uh, I would hate to even count how many trolls, probably 300, something like that, but um, that's what's, oh, hang on, yeah. So this is what helped us get to that point, the perfect storm at the perfect time. So I was, uh, Month before my 21st, 21st birthday, when I moved there, and uh, obviously young and young and keen and wanting to show mum and dad how deadly I was. So, um, and fortunately, though, at the time, we had high cattle and grain prices, low interest rates, and a good team of people. So everything came together at the same time to to allow us to be able to go hard and, and get that get that infrastructure in. Um, so that's oh, just a picture of home, clean running creeks, you know, as we'd all, all love to have. Um, so development was 250 kilometres of fencing, 180 kilometres of polypipe. Built a new set of yards, 2,000 hectare capacity, rehabilitated 1,000 hectares of weed infestations, rubber mine and, and belly ache. Rehabilitated 18 hectares of gullies with the help of, well, they did all the work, Greening Australia. Uh, and put a new quarters in and countless renovations, trying to make it all a a better place for the for the people that were working there. Um, so when I had moved up there, Dad was saying we needed to brand four thousand calves for it to be, um, you know, self sustaining. So the first year I was there, we branded twenty seven hundred, um, and then we you know started to get get all this work going. And uh, second year was thirty three hundred, then. The following year was 4,200, the following year is 4,200, uh, 4, and then the, the next year was 4,800. And so the, that being last year, 2020, uh, we didn't get a break in the season until February 19th, um, so no rain until that point. And then we had 250 mils for the wet season. And with all of that, uh, because of all that development, we're over around 4,863 cars. Um, and get them off. So if we hadn't if we hadn't done that development, there's no way we would have been able to, you know, achieve achieve that. So and now coming into this year, because we were able to, you know, leave the country in that good of a position when the wet season started, um, we're going to be able to take on another 1,500 cows. So it um, has certainly paid dividends, and, and um, not only in the staff work working within it, but but the, the cattle, um, cattle are happy as well. So this is just a few photos of the crew and a bit of the work that's going on. All 75 mil pipe. That um, weed area there, that was, that's that there. So you can, if the dozer was another blade with over, you wouldn't be able to see it for the rubber line. Uh, so it was a bit of a, ecological disaster, um, even though, you know, the Queensland government's gonna call that land clearing. Um, yeah, we've, we've um, it's certainly a lot better off for it. Uh, dreams are just girls with work boots on. It was one of my mum's favorite sayings and I, I picked it up and, and ran with it. It's uh, certainly going through the RCS system and the grazing for profits, you know, they get you to write down um, your goals by you know, mid, short, mid and long term. And um, at the end of the grazing for profit school, they get you to write a letter to yourself. And uh, 12 months, you know, what I'm gonna be doing in 12 months time. And I uh, wrote this letter and, and gave it to them or whatever. And they sent it to me 12 months later. I opened it up and read it. And everything I'd written on that letter, even without, you know, there were some pretty out there goals. Everything that I'd written in that letter had come true. It was pretty, um, Pretty powerful stuff, you know, you don't have to sit there and look at it every day if you write it down and, and forget about it, it sort of stays there in your subconscious and, and um, somehow you manage to get it all done. So that, uh, that one there, that's gravity. So we pumped um, the old big pipeline from the river up to the middle of the place. Uh, it's got 90 metres ahead and, um, and now I've got about 140 kilometres of polypipe coming off that one header tank, which is the one in the photo there also, and uh, and it's all 
all delivered by gravity. So it was sort of getting that, that plan to start with. We continued to run more poly off of that, but getting that plan to start with and then working to that plan, um, yeah, made, made all that happen. That there's observant. I don't know if you guys are um, using those, but you know, um, as we're talking about the technology and making your job easier, we've got 12 observants or something like that that you know measure rainfall and, and tank level and that sort of thing, and um, it's helped us go from two to three water runs a week, or, or constantly worrying about the water and going out and checking it every day to to one water run a week, and and um, yeah, save the countless hours of, of worry and and. Uh, countless litres of fuel. Uh, so this is, yeah, one other bit of that, that plan, cleaning up the weeds. Um, so any gear that uh, that was done, it cost us 100, 120 bucks an acre to, to do that. But um, as you can see in that photo, it really wasn't worth anything at all. Because it was so thick, the wallaby population was so high in there, even if you didn't put cattle in there, it still wouldn't grow anything. And uh, a perimeter around that infestation as well also grow nothing, as you can see in that photo. So um, to go from that to that in a year is certainly worth a, a fair bit of money to you, to your uh, capital, but also um, you know the numbers of cattle you can run extra. Uh, is another one that's bellyache bush. I'm not sure if uh, many people here are familiar with that one. But it's a corker, takes over, puts a toxin in the soil so nothing else can grow underneath it. Um, anyway, and that, that was after it was cleared, then we sprayed it, and we still weren't getting any results, so we did ultra density trial and bale grass cows, and that was, um, so from that to that was one wet season, from that to that was one wet season, so it just shows you the pair of cows. Um, Animal. So selecting for fertility since 2004 through Supergen with the with the existing uh, herd of cows that came with the place, and then mum and dad uh, had waggies at Wentworth for 20 odd years and hadn't um, hadn't got onto these, got onto waggie at Strathalbyn yet. Okay. Yes, wait, I'm done anyway. Um, <laughs> So transitioned to Wagyu at Scott Darwin since 2015 uh, and have also introduced uh, pole bulls. And we went from, you know, sort of an average of 74% uh, pregnancy rate in our cows uh, to 85% pregnancy rate in our cows, but went from a 30% uh, rebreed rate in our first calf to second calf heifers to a 80% rebreed rate from first calf to second calf heifers. So that made a big difference to the bottom line. Um, and pole bulls, you know, that's another thing that makes ringers really happy when they don't have to dehorn every single beast that comes through the head bar. And uh, I certainly like it too, and I'm sure the cows also appreciate it. So anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Bristo. Really appreciate it. I think everyone would have gained some valuable insights. Right, to keep things moving along, I'd like to invite um, the Honourable Mr. David Littlecrow, MP, Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, up to the stage to address the audience. Thank you and thank you for the invitation to be here. This is the one session that I really wanted to make sure I came, uh, not just to talk, but actually listen. Uh, we have lost generations of young people out of rural regional Australia. It is time to bring them home. And I say thank you to you for having the courage to be out there and to be in the next generation in agriculture, whether that be on the land or in the new jobs of agriculture, the service industries that are out there that are supporting them. We have a bright future and we have to talk it up. For generations we've talked it down, and I'm the victim of that. My old man, I wasn't academically gifted. My old man said to me it was too hard to come back on the land, I'd go and do something else. Uh, and probably it saved me uh, some pain and, and anxiety of being a farmer today, but I've ended up being the Australian Agriculture Minister, which is the greatest honour anyone can be bestowed on coming from regional rural Australia. So you are our hope. You are the next generation of hope to bring your next generation back to rural and regional Australia. My job is to sit and listen. 
not to talk to you, but to sit and listen. What are your fears? What are your aspirations? What are your challenges? Uh, that's what I want to learn uh, from being here today. Simply that. Uh, that's the, the unique opportunity that I've been given. Uh, it's something that's a privilege that I should not take lightly, and that's why I, I want to be here today simply to listen to you all. But can I just say thank you? Uh, you are taking a leap of faith in rural and regional Australia. And for that, our nation says thank you, because without you, it fails. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions if anyone would like to ask anything, uh, or, or make a statement and tell me what the challenges or, or uh, aspirations are to think that we as a federal government, uh, here's your chance to, to get into the federal government in any way, shape or form. Five minutes for questions if anyone would like to ask anything. How do you go from being someone from our west and then go and be a politician? Um, because I lived in rural and regional Australia, I've never lived outside my electorate of Maranoa. I am the product of rural and regional Australia. I'm probably one of the only people in the cabinet, it's the highest boardroom in the country, that doesn't have a tertiary education. Do you know what? That was, that was a, a, a mental challenge to get around to start with in terms of feeling adequate enough to sit at the table with, with the political titans of the country. But then I thought about it and went, you know what? I am a bloke from Western Queensland. And what we do is we don't go in the fetal position and give up, we just swing. And you have to stay true to the people who made you. And the people of the little town of Chinchilla made me. And I was fortunate enough to then work in the National Bank right through Charles, Connor Mullis and George, right into Stanthorpe and Warwick. Um, though I am the product of that rural, rural and regional Australia. And this is the mindset we've also got to change. We often think that because we come from the bush, we're not, we're not as equal or superior to those in metropolitan Australia. I would say we are superior. You've had a better start to life than what those that live in the capital cities have had. Uh, the investment your parents have made in you, in education, uh, but also in, in investing in you and coming back, set, sets you up better in life than anyone else in this country. And that's why we've all got to be loud and proud about where we've come from and what we do. I mean, 200 metres down the road, there are people out there at the moment trying to tear down the very fabric and challenge what you do for a living. The, the actual ethical and sustainable way that you produce food and fibre for this country. And let me tell you, during this COVID-19 recession, if it wasn't for you, and it wasn't for resources, this country's economy would be buggered. And it's time for the nation to understand the powerful role that you play. You are joining an industry that has saved this nation. And this is the window of opportunity for us to remind everyone that lives in a capital city in particular that, that thinks living on 600 square metres of dirt and a six foot gullibond fence, and if that's living, good luck to you. But it's time for us to remind them just how important you are to them and this nation. So be proud. Go out there and put the chin out because you know what? If you don't, um, someone's gonna, someone's gonna take over and you're gonna get things put on, on top of you that you don't deserve. So uh, I just say the challenge for you and all of us is to go out and be loud and proud because we've got a damn good story to tell. Now we're just waiting for a mic. Yeah, I really don't belong in this room because obviously I'm not under 35. <laughs> Me neither. I'm just old saying it. But, uh, David, this is a little unfair on you, but these people in this room are our future, which you've just said. And there is something really important that the government can do to help us, as the over 35s, pass down to the next generation. And I hope you know what I'm talking about because my husband had lunch with you the other day. But the thing is, uh, I believe you're a politician that speaks from the heart and you have the right background and the right intention. However, you're, in, you're the uneducated one in the room, no uh, tertiary um, diploma behind your name, but none of, most of us don't, well the young ones do. But sorry, I'll just say, that idea is about, and Richard won't even help me because he said not the place, it is, because we need these people in this room, these young ones, to be lobbying for the same thing. And that's how we're able to pass our uh, assets down without giving it all away to the government because you, sorry, not you personally, but we give enough to the government 
to keep people that don't want to work able to not work. Yeah. So these people, and uh, maybe Richard would give a quick thing, or you would, because then I'd know you understood it, yeah, yeah. to um, make it so we can pass our assets without losing half of them. So, so this pertains to capital uh, gains tax, uh, and particularly around succession. And I can tell you, um, as someone that used to be an agribanker, they were some of the most challenging conversations you had with families at the kitchen table. Uh, and it sometimes brought emotive, emotive conversations that didn't always end well. And so navigating that's important, but I think the role that we can play is twofold. And I think looking at, at that capital gains tax in terms of passing it through uh, and, and in terms of uh, having to sell property to purchase other ones, there can be some pragmatic solutions to that. Um, and I think that's one of the, one of the legs of the solutions. Uh, the other one that, that I'm very passionate about, while we've started the Regional Investment Corporation, we've got the AgriStarter loans. Uh, they are just vanilla lending products. Uh, they keep competitive tension with the banks, which is a good thing. But what I'm trying to explore with the banks uh, is now looking at how does the Australian government support young people to buy their first property? Not necessarily with a loan, but is it through a guarantee? We're able to do it for the first homeowners uh, in capital cities. Uh, a first farmers guarantee where the government plays a role in supporting the banks in you getting into it. Because the biggest, the biggest impost in you getting in is the capital costs and then the capital outlay to stock it or to buy the gear to run them run the, the machinery. So uh, it's important that we get that balance right. So I think the capital gains tax is one leg of the solution uh, and I think the other piece is to continue to explore. And I've got to say, I don't know whether any of the banks are here, but I, they have been um, very forward leaning on this and we are trying to work through what that will look like because um, that, is, that is going to be the biggest impost in terms of succession, but even just giving someone a start uh, is the capital cost. And that's why I say that's our opportunity. But I'm also very cognizant of the fact that there are other new jobs of agriculture as well. And, and while not everyone will want to go on the land, what we're also trying to do is bring in the new jobs in the research, uh, science and tech. Uh, and in fact, we just announced new, eight new innovation hubs uh, in regional universities. I didn't, I, I've got nothing against Sandstone universities. They do a great job. But I think regional universities are the ones where uh, agri can really be rolled out of and rolled out better because then there's the adoption extension piece of it as well where we'll do the research, we'll do the technology, but we're creating the new jobs in regional Australia. There's over $1 billion a year in R&D money through levy payers and through the Australian taxpayer that if we were to funnel it through our regional universities and you actually had a say in what that research is better than what we've got now, then lo and behold, uh, you get $1.1 billion flowing through regional Australia, you're creating regional jobs. And when I talk about bringing our young people home, that's not just to the land. That's also into the new jobs of agriculture, the next pillar of agriculture uh, that I believe we can build. Uh, but the big thing that we can do is just pragmatic policy that Richard uh, really gave me the kitchen, kitchen table thrown at me on, on Monday or whenever it was. But I think that it's not a big ask for government to, to look at this because I don't think the impost financially on the budget is significant, particularly if we're making an investment in our most important asset, which is you. If we don't have that, then we don't have rural and regional Australia. So we're looking at a suite of those things, and I'm not talking on the never, never, two or three years after the next election. These are things we're formulating now, um, and it's been because we come and listen to you. And those are the sort of things that I'm hearing as I get around new shed meetings. One more. David, you've been here all week, which I think is a, a wonderful sign for the commitment from, from government. Um, what, my question is, um, is there one thing that you've learned over your time at Beef that you didn't know prior to arriving on Monday? I think, I just probably, I've, I've, I've had a couple of hats. I've been Ag Minister since 17 with a little, a little hiatus for six or seven months. And I've also had an emergency management. Uh, and I've always heard about how strong we are in the bush. But you know what, I've, uh, over the last three years since the last beef, I've seen some pretty ordinary things. I mean, I remember flying up in the northwest Queensland, uh, those floods, uh, flying in and talking to cockies who just said, mate, I've, what have you got? And they absolutely lost it all, but there's some poor bugger down the road that's worse off. Uh, seen bushfires, seen stuff I, I don't even want to see again. But when I come here, I see hope. And it reinforced to me 
I probably knew it, but I think, I, I sort of hoped it was right. But I believe in it now because I've seen it here. I was just saying as I walked in, I've never been to a beef or any ag, any ag conference or, or field day where there's actually true optimism. You can feel it from inside of everyone you meet. And that, that is not just resilience, that's pride. And that's pride about what you do and where we're from. And that's what makes us different from those buggies in the city. And that's a good thing. And that's why I'm saying, I, I think the big thing is it's probably nothing new, but it just really has just reinforced after all the shitty things I've seen over the last two years, that it's you people um, that has just been new to me that that hope still exists. And particularly when I see forums like that. And, and the one thing is that we've all got to understand now is there's an opportunity to leave a legacy of that. And you now are the custodians of that for generations to come. And so custodians of that before, like the Richard Hughes that are sitting here today, they've done their bit. It's now time for the baton to be handed over to you. And you can do it, just like Richard Hughes and everyone else uh, over 35 in this room that's played their bit. But never underestimate your contribution, because I'm just a bloke from Western Queensland with a year 12 education, and I'm sitting at Cabinet, and I still don't know how. So, Mr Little, oh, sorry. Mr Little Proud will be um, staying around at the Smoko, so if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to go up and talk to him. Righto, if I could um, ask the professional development panel to come forward. I think that's Ollie, uh, Beck, Sam and Chloe. Righto guys, so the purpose of this session is um, to provide a bit of an overview of some of the professional development and mentoring you know, opportunities there are out there in the beef industry. Um, if you would like any sort of further information on any of, on any of these specific programs, uh, I think the website's uh, yep, up on the screen behind us. Um, but for this short session, uh, we have four incredible panellists. Uh, Chloe, Sam, Beck and Ollie, um, who are gonna share some of their insights from the various programs that they've been involved with. I'll start with you, Chloe. Chloe, you're um, with Meat Standards Australia as a business development officer, um, and you're here today representing the Graham Acton Beef Connections program, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Do you just wanna give us just a quick one minute background on yourself? Yeah, sure. So uh, for the past four and a half years, uh, I've been working with uh, Tease Australia and more recently just moved uh, to Meat Livestock Australia as the MSA Senior Business Development Officer. Uh, before that, I uh, went through uh, the University of Queensland uh, and did a Bachelor of Agricultural Science. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So you're a current participant in the Graham Acton Mentoring Program. Can you please explain to the, us in the audience um, the journey that you've been on and how it has benefited you both personally and professionally? Yeah, sure. So the Graham Acton Beef Connections Program is a 12 month leadership program where you get to be able to join along with a mentor, but not only a mentor, nine other participants in the program that join me here today in the room. I guess this program um, runs in conjunction with Beef Australia every three years. Um, you, you apply for the program about six months before um, you know beef actually starts. So back in, I think about May, uh, the program opened, uh, and then you applied. You know, obviously go through that selection process. Um, from this program, I guess it's really um, what I've got out of it is that journey with those nine other mentor partners, and also the the eleven mentors. Um, you know, we've all come from different facets of life. Um, and just hearing their journey and being able to go along with them 
Um, and then also the, the workshops um, that the facilitator, Bob Bishop, um, has been able to facilitate um, has been really an incredible journey. Um, we've really been able to focus in on media, presentation skills, um, then we've done a lot of self-development, um, you know, really learning about ourselves, uh, how we communicate, time management, um, so yeah, really good professional and personal development opportunity. Um, one that I guess I'm really thankful and humbled to be a part of the, the Graham Act and Big Connections program. Yeah, good one, sounds interesting. Um, so Sam, Sam Cobb, you're a producer from Plomont, um, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yep, and you're here representing the Advancing Beef Leaders Program or the ABL course. Could you give us just a one minute intro? Yeah, sure. So I won't um, delve into the actual uh, you know, um, startings of ABL because that will be spoken about later in this session today, but um, yeah, it was a pilot program uh, put on by DAF. Um, and um, yeah, so we were the North Queensland uh, pilot program for that. Um, yeah, as it, it's, it's um, solely high level professional development, but with that comes a lot of personal development as well. Um, yeah, and for, for me personally, it uh, just came at a pivotal time, I guess. I survived uh, succession, and uh, you can survive. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and felt like that need to give back to the industry but not knowing where to start. Uh, definitely the level of professional development in this with the jewellery needs, really spices, um, education models, uh, technical foundations, it, it definitely sets you up for, for that, um, yeah, for, to go ahead with that, to, to go forth. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic program. So what made you, you know, apply for the program and get into it? Was it post-succession planning or were there other reasons as well? Yeah, as I yeah, probably just alluded to, like, um, yeah, just a pivotal time of, of uh, yeah, of our lives, like, we, you know, we've, it all get busy in our own um, backyards and I think you know we we underestimate what we can give back to the industry um, and but and also and not knowing how to start that journey so that was when when it um, was delivered from my doorstep via Facebook I thought you know there's an opportunity a door uh, yeah always uh, you know a door opens that's where you uh, you, know, you you take the chance when you've got it yeah, no, that's great. I'm actually part of the uh, 2021 group of ABL course, and it's a fantastic program. Um, Beck, yep. you're a producer from Orgathella, um, and you're here today representing the Nuffield Australia um, program. Could you give us a one minute intro on yourself? Um, thanks. Um, so I wasn't as young as Bristow. Um, I wasn't 21, but uh, 29, and we got launched into um, our first property opportunity, which we were very, very lucky. We knew that at the time. So interest rates were 9%. We didn't have the cash flow to cover our interest um, payments. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, we definitely yeah, had our work boots on to achieve our dream. So we hooked in and did a lot of water and wire development. It was pretty similar to the Bristow story. And um, actually just got the profit driving things happening in our business. So. Got our grazing management sorted, got our herd management sorted with seasonal mating. But really, it was quite frustrating because we'd done all this work with our um, herd management, but then I'd go to buy bulls, and I just felt like I was taking a backward step. So I was being hard on my cows, but to bring the bulls in was just a real issue. So I was just like, we've got a real problem in the north when I'm looking for tropical cattle that are well adjusted. So it really just got me thinking about how can I solve this problem? which led me down the road to Nuffield. So... Yeah, okay, and um, so the drivers behind joining the Nuffield course were looking for ways to solve a problem within your business, is that correct? Yeah, definitely. Like, I felt like we'd address those main profit drivers that I could, so the next thing was genetics. So I just had this burning desire to find out more about how I could optimise my genetic selection um, with our herd in, um, in tropical cattle particularly. So. I thought, rightio, well, I'll be part of the solution. I'm going to become a seed stock producer and look at how I can actually address this gap in the industry. So I um, went through the Nuffield process and applied for a Nuffield scholarship, of which um, I suppose our point of difference is, is global. 
So we've got like access to 1,800 alumni worldwide and also 500 alumni in Australia. So that was a big draw card for me. And I must admit, um, I was a bit tentative about the 10,000 word like um, report you have to write, but I thought I'd deal with that. Funnily enough, I actually learned a hell of a lot from pulling together all the information in that 10,000 word report. So I found it to be a massive part of the personal and professional development that we had with Nuffield. Um, and I got to travel to 14 countries as a result, nearly 250,000 K in 2019. And um, yeah, to come home and pull that information together in a report, which you guys can access online now, um, all of the reports are there. Um, but if you've got a burning desire or a problem that you think that yeah, could be, you could be part of the solution for, now feels great where it gives you that opportunity to network with people on similar wavelengths so to solve pro a problem. Yeah, it certainly uh, opens a wide variety of doors right across the globe, doesn't it? It certainly does, yeah. So applications open on the um, 24th of May. If there's anyone in this room who's interested in, please have a yarn to me because I'm a huge advocate for what it can offer. Um, and yeah, we've got around COVID with um, virtual tours um, around the world and still being able to interview, but hopefully back into it, business as normal next year for travel. So yeah, can't yeah. recommend it enough. Thank you. Um, Ollie, I've seen Ollie for about two years. I've seen too much of him this week. Mate, you're, you're the contact marketing uh, manager for Auctions Plus currently, um, but today you're here representing the Australia Rural Leadership Foundation and also the Xander McDonald Award. Uh, do you want to just give us one, one minute intro on yourself and how you got here? Thanks, Locke. Uh, yeah, so Ollie Malou. Uh, I thought Locke was going to have a crack at trying to pronounce my last name. So. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, but yeah, well, I suppose I grew up in Sydney, so a city guy, uh, fell in love with ag from, from a young age. Um, yeah, had, had family and farming in, in Western Victoria and I suppose felt like a country kid that was nearly a border. So during the holidays it was out on the farm and then the rest of the time I was living in Sydney. Uh, I suppose, yeah, for me during my career so far, uh, I've been working in ag full time now for 10 years. V very much early on it was about uh, getting that experience, getting boots on the ground. Uh, I worked across sheep, cattle and cropping in Eastern Australia and then took the chance to go across to Canada, um, studied at Marcus Oldham. And yeah, I suppose the last five years has been looking at different opportunities, whether it was uh, exporting asparagus out of Kiwi Rub, uh, through to Ag Tech, um, had a crack working in a corporate more, more recently before joining Auctions Plus just a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, you've certainly got an interesting career path into Ag. Um, mate, we've spoken before uh, and in the past about the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation um, program and, and how it's really pushed you out of your comfort zone so far. Mate, can you just run the audience through you know, what that program is and also want to know how it's you know, benefited you both personally and professionally? Yeah, so I suppose um, I've been fortunate that I think probably opportunities created opportunities. So I sat here at B 2018 and Fiona Simpson mentioned the $100 billion vision and that beyond, uh, beyond B 2018 that they'd be running some round tables across the country. So I suppose I, I yeah, going, it sounded interesting. The industry wanted input from people in the room, so I went down and attended one of the, the sessions in Gippsland, um, and, and then that led into the creation, which came directly out of those roundtables, was that we needed to upskill and build capability of young people in agriculture, and that came in the form of the 2030 Leaders Program. Uh, the Australian Rural, rural Leadership Foundation were tasked with facilitating that uh, as the leader in rural leadership programs. And I, I suppose through that, there was eight of us in the inaugural uh, cohort. Probably the, the key learnings from that, which I think is transferred from yeah, a, a course like that. You walk into it, uh, the first part was five days, and it basically turned up, and there's drop your bags, you're not here to, to learn about agriculture, you're actually here to learn about yourself. And w when you start to do that, and the ability to become more self-aware, I think that translated across uh, right, right into your day-to-day, -day. and I think for me, now at Options Plus with managing people. Um, the, the big part is when it comes to yeah, someone's response to what you're doing, it's well actually, what have I done that may have created that and, and how do you react to that? Yeah, yeah, no good. So there you go, look, the, Ollie hasn't touched on the Xander Award. Do you just want to give us a minute on that? Yeah, well, there's probably someone, oh, there's a few people in the room far more credentialed than me. So um, Rosie O'Reilly's down the back, she's this year's winner. Uh, we've joined up, Ros. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
which is, yeah, is amazing. Xander McDonald Award is named after Xander McDonald, who was a, a true leader in, in the industry. He tragically passed away uh, too young, but I think we, it goes on that his legacy is lived on through people like Shannon, Emma, Rosie, uh, and I suppose I was fortunate to be a finalist in that. I, I've, yeah, being a finalist, I think naturally you invest a lot of time here in those applications. Um, bummed not to win, but I think it's probably part of that is, is the learnings you take away from it. And yeah, just getting getting that far, what you learn through the application process, and then uh, Rosie will, will, will take off uh, on a mentoring trip around Australia and hopefully New Zealand if the bubble stays open, depending on what happens in Sydney, these eastern suburbs. And uh, I think, yeah, for, for me as a finalist, you still get access to the people. You, you become part of the platinum primary producer group and you've got access to 150 of the top producers across Australia and New Zealand. Can I just add to the application process, Ollie? I, um, I actually met a bloke that applied for enough for four times. And yeah, he just said what he got from <coughs> each attempt, you know, he just grew as a person. So I think that's probably something that summarises all of us is that it's really, um, yeah, you might have a project or something you're doing, but it does come down to actually the professional and personal development of yourself um, as much as you don't go into it realising it. And I guess even the development, you know, of just going through that application process of signing up to one of these things, even if you don't get it. So there you go, guys. There's five um, great sort of networking and professional development courses out there and available. And these guys have obviously gone through them and gained a lot out of it. So just before Smoko, we'll just open it up to the floor. If there's any questions for any of these guys on their various journeys through these programs. So what can I jump in with one So um, the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation is great to have the minister here as well. So the Drought Leaders Program begins uh, in the next couple of months. It's initially been launched and applications will open for that soon. I, I think they want to put about 300 people through that program and essentially it is about how do we build the capability of people in rural and regional Australia to have impact that, yes, we're in good times right now, but um, yeah, the, the realist in me says those good times won't last and we will be faced with challenges and it's up to everyday people. I think we, we can look at government and, and wait for you guys to, to lead and make decisions, but at the end of the day, whether it's in the community or uh, as an industry, we need every, everyday people to step up. And as part of that, uh, we there's the leadership program, but then there's actually some funding to take. If you've got an idea, you can turn that into a reality in your community. Great. So much of the leadership really does have to come from the ground up, doesn't it? So, um, any questions? Hi, my name is Hannah Murray. I work for the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association. Um, thank you very much, um, a great session, um, Options Plus, I really enjoyed it. My question to the panel is, we have such great opportunities um, forging leadership in our young people in ag, and, and after Minister Litterprow um, spoke, it got me thinking about how do we get more engagement from young people in industry, maybe in, in trying to inform some of those political decisions. How do we capture some of the knowledge and ideas coming out of programs like these? on an industry body and a peak group level to make sure that we've, we're keeping everyone engaged after they've been through these sort of programs. Yeah, I might just speak on behalf of um, ABL there directly in saying that um, I'm, I'm, it is... <laughs> Yeah, it is one program in particular, and I'm sure of um, the Zand I know the Xander Awards is obviously the same thing, is the mentoring that comes through with that is um, really pivotal in, in, ca in, in um, capsulating that, but also encouraging that to continue. I think there's, there is real drive in that. And I think we've always had mentors, you know? We're just putting, it's like sustainability, we're now putting a name on it, right? So, um, but there's, there's a lot of power in, in those programs that have um, the mentoring and, and working and continuing support. Anyone else like that, Andrew? I, I think um, if there's an actual, like an, an inkling of interest, but you don't 
um, feel the confidence to step out, any of these programs help to bolster that. Um, so I think that really it's backing yourself and being proud enough to step out of your comfort zone, which um, is pretty comfortable sometimes. But I think that's probably a, a big thing. Like we, as young people, we do have to be brave enough to step forward. And yeah, I know I've got a tap on the shoulder of like, you know, a lot younger than 29 and I was like, oh God, not me. You know, like it's, um, so I think it's just backing yourself because we do need the youth and we do need your enthusiasm. So yeah, whatever helps you to be able to step up. I suppose just following that point too, like a lot of, and I suppose with the Future Farmers Network, had on, um, we, we have bursaries and people literally like five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars to our skill, and, and people don't actually apply for it. Like you, you sit on it. I, I think it to be a, a leader and, and actually step up and put your hand. It, it takes a lot of vulnerability and it, it is brave, but ultimately, but whether it's yeah saying you need help and that comes through the form of mentoring and, and taking that front, or actually yeah I suppose throwing your hat in the ring at Ultimately, I think everyone's in the same position and, and what you learn, whether it's out of the process or, or if you're fortunate to get into one of the, the programs, it's um, yeah, incredible and, and absolutely worthwhile. Yeah, no, thanks guys. I think we've got one more question over there before we break for Smoko. Thanks guys. Uh, potentially a little left field. However, we have some fantastic in industry stories about the things that we're doing for ourselves. Um, has the panel got some ideas on how we take these out of industry and into the urban sector to tell our story better, but also to bring them back um, to try and bolster our numbers in agriculture and support for agriculture? Um, yeah, so I suppose I saw an opportunity to create something called Humans of Agriculture a couple of years ago, and that was played off Humans of New York, which was everyday people sharing their stories. Um, yeah, essentially what I wanted to do, if, if we look at the traditional definition of someone in agriculture, it's someone who's working in farming, but whether you're in research or you're in journalism or you're in marketing, there's so many people who are influencing agriculture. And so I suppose, yeah, what, what I wanted to do was look at who are those people influencing it? And, and ultimately every single day, every consumer, if they're eating or, or wearing fibre, that they are influencing agriculture. And so I think for us, it's how do we actually step outside that, our, our area of comfort, not necessarily look to find those cheerleaders, which we might tend to go for, it's how, how you might get your following, but it is yeah, being brave and actually going. And I heard a quote this week, it, it was around um, listening to understand, not listening to respond. And I think for us as an industry, that's something which uh, I believe we can get a lot better at. Anyone else agree with that? I probably can do that too, in that. <coughs> Um, I think a lot of us are already doing it. You know, we have these platforms, um, Instagram, Facebook, and you know, a lot of a lot of us are already posting, you know, everyday photos. It's thinking, I guess, um, you know, who's seeing that and what you can, you know, just add maybe a few little words, and you know, someone you might take for granted, you're, you know, you're um, riding along behind a mum and cattle, but you know, if you just had a little bit more of a uh, feel on there of what, what you're actually doing for that, you don't know who's watching that, who's seeing it, and I think there's a lot of, you know, we have these fantastic platforms now, we just need to, you know, be mindful of how we're using them. Okay, that's great. One more after that, Angus. Thanks, Lock. Um, we had a really interesting conversation on our rooftop earlier this week uh, around the softer skills um, that you, that I guess potentially the industry is lacking. Um, and I think what people might not be aware is that actually in these programs when, you know, they might be around a specific project or you're going in there to learn a specific skill, you actually, there's a huge amount of personal development that occurs and that, that those softer skills around maybe managing people or how to lead differently. Um, and I guess it, what I'm keen to hear is from each of the panellists, perhaps a, a personal, I guess, development piece um, that they've learnt in their journey, um, if, if there is one. Yeah, so I guess I touched on this um, yesterday in our Big Connections talk um, and really focused in on um, a, a lot of the times we talk about the technical skills that we actually require uh, to be able to do our jobs. And we often forget about those soft skills, like how to build a relationship, how to actually communicate, 
Um, and, and that's really, um, you know, the people of what really matters. Um, the young gentleman up here before, he touched on that. Um, he really focused on the people. And I guess, you know, throughout the Beef Connections program, um, a, a classic example was I was roomed um, with a, a young lady that's here in the room today with me, um, as is my other uh, mentor partners. But I, I guess I didn't get to know her. Um, I didn't know her when I came into the program. I physically sat in the room waiting for her to come along um, to the program on, the, our, on our first workshop and actually took that time to actually invest to get to know her um, just so that one, we could build that relationship and two, um, you know, those, those communications, um, you know, between us so that we could go along on the journey um, together and I guess, um, you know, as we've gone along the journey, I've really invested in uh, being able to get to know each and every one of those mentor partners um, as well as the mentors. Um, and, you know, we've really come together as a family, I guess, um, and we're able to lean on each other and really bounce um, off each other and move, um, you know, move forwards together. So, yeah, and guess that those soft skills I, I can't touch on anymore, that, you know, those communications, relationships, they're really important. Yeah, um, absolutely, you know, with professional development comes personal development too. And, um, um, yeah, so so we uh, when we were allocated mentors, I I asked one of them in particular um, what her greatest life lesson has been, and she said um, that it was you know being okay with being the lowest fruit on the branch, and I think that is that's very powerful, and that you know we tend not to want to put our hands up for this stuff, thinking you know I'm not like, you know I've got nothing to offer or. Um, you know, I don't want to be sitting in a panel on a microphone talking to all these people, you know. Um, yeah, and when you do walk through that door, the, the opportunities are, are huge for you and, and you grow with that, absolutely. Um, the soft skills were something that surprised me. Um, I'd done a bit of work with that before, applying for a Nuffield. But there's three elements to Nuffield. So you go to this Contemporary Scholars Conference first up and there's 70 scholars worldwide, all different nationalities, broken English but quite amazing because it's their second language. There's the second part is Global Focus Program. So after meeting 70 scholars from across industries, so poultry and cropping and you're thinking you've got nothing in common with them, you learn quite quickly that you do. And then you get sent off for now it's going to be a month, um, four weeks, and you travel with 10 scholars from um, lots of different countries. And we don't just do beef. Like I think that there was only five beef scholars out of the 70. So we go to all different farms and with a part of that, we just got forced into a leadership role and swapped every day. So I you know you had to be in charge of these like 10 very strong individuals, like all passionate about their industry. And yeah, it was really interesting to listen to understand, um, as Ollie mentioned earlier. So I found that there was so much I could learn from the poultry farmer. Well, there's so much I could learn from a Brazilian who's not worked, used to women actually getting in a stockyard, you know, and being mindful that their culture, they had cultural differences. So there was a lot I learned on soft skills just because of that, you know, framework that we had, and I felt that it was a really powerful part of it. And then to travel individually after doing those two things, we had a lot um, more refined soft skills in our questioning ability to make sure that we stop, pause, listen and extrapolated the information that would help us with our report. So, yeah, great question, thanks. I don't really know what I'll add. Um, <laughs> I think you covered everything. I suppose, yeah, my, on the relationships front, I think that that's huge. And going back to the, the first program we did, um, we, we were working on a project and someone came up to me and said, Ollie, I don't think you're listening to me. And I was just like, but it was, I suppose we're more forward than that. And I just went, oh, man, like, I definitely didn't handle it as well as I could, but I think coming back to that relationship piece, probably the benefit of hindsight was the fact that we could have that conversation that um, we were comfortable enough to go up to each other, call each other out on, on actions and behaviours. Probably, yeah, it is those soft skills, whether it's dealing with a customer, with your workers. Uh, I think, yeah, as Angus said, it's come up time and time again this week. Uh, probably one of the, the key areas, whether you're um, about to exit the industry and hand it over to the next generation or you're just coming in, it's, you know, I suppose, being a real person, first and foremost, and then translating that um, yeah, across into how you carry yourself. Yeah, no, that's good. 
Um, we'll break for smoke now, sorry, Roger. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, please use this opportunity to grab any of the, um, any of the panelists here and, and or uh, the speakers from before, and Mr. Little Crowd will be here uh, to enjoy a cup of coffee as well. Thanks guys, we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Generation Grazier, and we have never had this kind of conversation at our dining table about representation in our industry. Imagine that. Like, it's my way of life, it's my father's way of life, and as a dad to three amazing kids, it's their future. So, what changed? What made me decide to become a member of the Cattle Council? Well, along the journey that I've had with the Men's and Beef Leaders Program, I've learned some things from these amazing people right here. And those things I want to share with you today. And that is that there is no progress without involvement, and you can't expect improvement without contribution. Thank you very much. And please make welcome Emma Knight and Neil Mount Murray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank chat about your understanding of the red meat industry structure prior to our involvement with the Advancing Beef Leaders Group. Thanks, Anita. Um, so much like Sam just said, prior to Advancing Beef Leaders, my I thought my knowledge was there and I thought I had a really good understanding of how the red meat industry worked. Um, a little off-the-cuff conversation with Jason Strong where he just um, threw in the word the MOU really pricked my ears and I've gone, what are you talking about, Jason? What, are you, what, what is this MOU? Um, and that started me on a really big journey of research to really understand adequately our peak industry councils and how the red meat industry uh, is funded and how it works and, and how it's structured. Um, so along, along the journey, and it has been a journey, and it's, a, it's been a very difficult journey to understand. It's, it's so complex, it's, it's incredibly complex. Did learn there are so many people at that level and at that top and in those boardrooms that want to bestow that wisdom upon us and want us to be involved, and that that really inspired and encouraged me to keep going. Um, my understanding is now great, and I feel like I can have a really adequate and in-depth conversation um, around that. And if you do have any conversation, oh, any questions, or would like to know more, please do come and see me. I am. Um, as mentioned, it's complex, so I've compiled a 12-page document that really condenses and, and explains the MOU and, and Peak Industry Council. So please do um, come and approach any, any one of us to access that. Um, that will kickstart your journey um, to understanding. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, she's uh, cloudy in about at least three or four days, days, full days in a row, trailing through all of the websites to put that together. Um, since then, how have you stepped up off the grandstand and out into the field to start to contribute? Yeah. So, uh, in the session before Smoko, Hannah, if you are still here, um, asked a really uh, great question about where to after you've completed the leadership journey. Um, I, with the amazing support of my mentor, Russell Lethbridge, um, to the left of me here, there was an opportunity about six months ago to apply for the Young Producers Council on A-Force, which is a pilot program never been done before. So I picked up the phone to my mentor, and I think it's been captured this morning how valuable and important they are to us, and whether you're in a leadership program or, or personally, find yourself a mentor. Um, so I picked up the phone to Russell and I said, look, I've come across this opportunity. I'm, I know I'm not ready and I'm not, I'm not aware enough to, to be at that table, but I'm thinking about it. Uh, much like David, uh, little, Mr. Littleproud said earlier, I don't have an education beyond year 12, and that was a complete barrier for me. Not, not from anyone else, a personal barrier that I, I built for myself. 
um, Russell was able to just smash that and say, Em, that's not what this is about. You know, you're so ready for this and we need young people to step up and become involved. So I, I thought about it and I, I to and fro and I did the application and I didn't think about it for a, a little bit and Russell kept on me. And I put that application in and now I'm really happy to say I'm having meaningful contribution to industry through that avenue. So I'm a councillor on the Young Producers Council of Ag Force and I've been asked to be an active observer of the cattle board, um, which is amazing. And I have had this dream um, for a long time. I remember sitting on the fence line, walking cattle, you know, 20 k's across the Barclay. You can see that windmill for a long way before you get there. Um, saying, I want to be in these positions. I want to be at that level. I just didn't know how I could do it. Um, and didn't believe in myself with not having that further education. So it's absolutely able, and like I said, there's so many people rooting for us out there that want to see us come through. So um, it's, it's, it's been an amazing experience. And that's all part of joining a leadership program like Advancing Beef Leaders, and then stepping out of, out of the other side of that. Getting out of your comfort zone. <laughs> it was uncomfortable. Um, and what is your vision for the red meat industry? It's hard to actually, when you go through leadership journeys and professional development, it's really hard to actually define, or for me, sorry, it was really hard to define exactly what I wanted to achieve by doing this. Um, one of the most important things that I learned is that leadership is not a destination. Um, so I, I remember sitting on the horse saying, yeah, I want to be a leader. I, I really want to be a leader in industry and be known or, or whatever have you. And, it's absolutely not a destination. It's a journey. And I've actually got it written down because I didn't want to stuff it up. But it's, um... <laughs> Sorry, two seconds. You know, it, it's, it's not a destination, it's a journey. And it's a journey that gently inspires and influences others. Um, and leadership stems from social influence, not authority or power. So, <coughs> That's one thing. So I'm really encouraging everyone to just become involved and get on that journey. Um, but I'm also I really want to foster the prosperity of our of our industry, and I really want to protect and promote our product, um, and really demonstrate the vital role that red meat plays in a in a sustainable and a healthy and a balanced diet. It's um it's a it's a very important part of, of our world. There are 430,000 employees directly related to the beef, to the red meat and the livestock industry. So it's a pivotal, a pivotal part of the wheel that makes the world go round and we need to protect it and promote it. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think you had some goals there as well, but I might have covered off on some of those. Uh, in Birdbrook, so we have access to a lot of excellent training uh, trainers throughout the, uh, our beef leaders group and she had one quote in particular that with you. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. So, um, yeah, one of the, as Nina just said, I think I suppose if I can leave you with one thing that you remember from this, and that is, I really wanted to change your, your your head, your heart, your hands, and by that meaning your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions by doing something. So please reach out to any one of us to to start your leadership journey, or if you're on that leadership journey, well done, congratulations, and, and keep going because. Like I said, there's so many people that want to see us succeed and, and, and really get going with it. Thank you very much, Emma. Give her a round of applause. <laughs>
be part of uh, forming ICPA or the show committee or um, you know pretty well everything you can think of and so that was a role model that for me it was well you've got to get involved if you want to be a part of your community and make it better then you have to show up you know whether it's physically for working bees or being the treasurer on the kindy committee or um, or, or being part of the, the leadership team and so that was something that um, I always felt was important and whatever job I've done, um, I've always thought, well, I, I need to contribute to at least one voluntary organisation. So, you know, the Arts Council, I was on the board for that, um, the Queensland Arts Council where that existed and you know, other um, school committees and, and local community committees. So we're talking today more about agriculture and how you are contributing to that. Now, we are living through the golden years, and uh, it's just so fantastic because um, you would have heard the horror stories of the 1970s beef slump or um, you know, the live export crash or other um, things that have gone through the industry. Um, my grandfather lived till he was 105, so he talked about you know, red water and, and other you know, diseases and, and things that, that smashed the industry. But we are living in the heyday. And so what it is up to us is to be a part of ensuring that it lasts. That we are taking this opportunity of good prices and uh, investments, you know, whether it be on property, in abattoirs, in butcher shops. So I ran butchers for a few years. Uh, but all the things that connect up to make our industry successful. Now I think that if you're a young person uh, who's here, um, having a terrific time at beef, and yes, being a little bit dusty, perhaps, that uh, it, it's hard to imagine what that might be. But can I tell you consistently, uh, it is about asking the next question, rocking up to somebody, tell me what you think about this, how does this work? And, uh, and during my time, uh, whether it was, you know, in the stock camp or later on, um, you know, running in butcher shops and being able to rock up to Terry Nolan or uh, you know, to aim it and how does industry all fit together. Um, I had a very, very big whiteboard with lots of lines and circles and, and the minister is, is sorting that out, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, it is about asking people questions. People are very keen to share their information. And we are just having a, a great conversation before with Hannah about, you know, if there are a lot of grey heads in the room, all the more reason why you should speak up because they are also keen, they've been where you've been, they've sat in your, in your chair or walked in your boots, and they want you to, to take over from them, to succeed them and to provide the energy and the leadership for tomorrow. So never walk away from asking the question because I'm pretty sure if you're thinking it, there's somebody else around the room that's thinking it as well. So take that opportunity. Uh, but it is about getting involved and showing up and yes, Joining, joining your organisation, your peak, because it is only as good as all of us who care about our community, being the beef industry, standing up and getting involved. And then that, of course, rolls into politics. Now, I'm not going to be political because that's not what we're here about, but what I am going to talk about is being effective. So I've lived all of my life or worked in um, the North. And we have talked about our future and the opportunities for the North. You know, sitting under the stars with my grandfather at night or in the camp or whatever we were doing. And it is never ever about government. Government doesn't employ, it doesn't create jobs. Government doesn't do, uh, you know, breed the cattle, get them slaughtered. That is all industry, that is all us. What government does is provide a framework that we can get on with business. And I have to tell you, I'm really excited today because we have had a series of announcements that let us get on with being world-class producers and adopting the sort of innovation and exciting opportunities that we know have been waiting for us. They've been waiting for us to be able to take advantage of it. So whether it's internet connectivity, better roads, um, better access to insurance or to finance, all of this overlay is happening. Um, biosecurity defence so that we are safe in developing our industries. Now, 
that only happens if you get involved and you, because somebody needs to do my job next, somebody needs to do the minister's job next. We have to send people who are passionate about our industry, who know what we are talking about to Canberra. It's very tempting to say that looks a bit ordinary and I don't want to do that, but we have to, you know, push people who might have capacity <laughs> into jobs. Dave Little Proud pushed me into a job and, and I'm grateful because I get to talk about the things that we know need to happen. So there are lots of pathways to getting involved, but sometimes it's when you can feel it, you know, if you can feel it in your guts and you know that there's something that needs to be said, that's what you need to be walking towards, no matter how, how scary it feels. But get involved, ask the next question, there are people desperate to give you an answer, to mentor you, to hold out their hand, to pull you in um, to that conversation because you are the future. You are the future. So that's it. That's leadership. Jane, just one moment. We'd just like to uh, remind her that Cattle Council actually have uh, membership uh, yeah. free yeah. this week. Just use Beef Week as your promo code. <laughs> yeah. If it's free, it's for me, isn't that the same? <laughs> Everyone get on board. You know when you almost feel like you don't need to conclude because Susan has encapsulated everything that we've worked on as a team for the last six months. But I'd just like to ask, who in the audience owns one of these? Come on, stick your hands up. Who's got one? Now, they're relatively handy. They're good for keeping the rain off. And they feel comfortable when you put them on. It's kind of like a piece of armour. But they're also a symbol. And we see, we see our politicians wear them fairly regularly. Does anyone know why we all put consideration in why that means or what, what a hat actually means to the Australian public? And it's like saying, I'm part of that club. I know how to get dirt under my nails. I know what blisters are. In fact, it's almost as good, I think, as wearing the green and gold, but you're wearing the green and gold for rural Australia and saying that you're proud of it. So when you put on that hat, what does that mean? It means you're sending a message and you're saying that you believe in what that represents and you believe in the symbol of it. I'm as good as my word. The thing about symbols are they're funny things, right? They can be incredibly painful, uh, powerful, and they can really represent a group of people. And these hats, they'll represent us, united or divided, but they'll still represent us. So, like wearing the green and gold, you can do it from the court or you can do it from the stands. But if you sit in the paddock and you criticise the coach or abuse the players, you're not contributing, you're whinging, and you're probably wearing your hat while you're at it. So, on behalf of the people who are here, and I, I truly respect them and I really love that we've had some people who represent our industry right at the top come and speak to us here today. Um, I just want to put this to you. How can there be progress if there is no involvement? And by involvement, I mean this. If you wear the hat, you are involved. This is your livelihood, your industry and your passion. So I would say to this, if you're prepared to complain, put on your hat and get on the court. Um, we probably have five minutes for some quick questions. If anyone's got any for either um, the four ABL guys or Senator Susan. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, there'll be a hand up somewhere. <laughs> oh, there's one. Over there. <laughs> um, so I've got one for Emma. So um, I find myself in the place that I'm in in the industry. I kind of feel like I'm going nowhere a little bit, kind of like a cartoon that runs that goes nowhere. And um, 
in terms of stepping into a leadership program, I'm sure there's lots of people out there with a tertiary education and all these sorts of things, a little bit more age. I don't know how old you were or you are when you started, but how do you feel for people that are a little bit younger and a little bit less educated trying to come in and jump in? Thank you for that question. Um, I still, I'm very nervous sitting here today. I feel very vulnerable, but you've just got to do it because the Senator McDonald, she really believes in the, you know, all of us in this room, David Littlecrow, there are so many people that believe in you that you don't even know, that don't even actually know you. So it is tricky, and once you've made that decision, you'll go with it. You've just got to really make that initial decision first um, and commit to that, and just start networking. By being in this room and at SMOCO today, you're networking, you just start asking those questions. That's all I did with my mentor, and thankfully he's in the room, and I'm <laughs> getting a lot of strength from him, but. So many people want to see us do it and do it well. And there's so much wisdom to be bestowed upon us. So you just, there's little, little, little sections that will really stick with you and things that will really make the penny drop with you. And you'll know when you get that. But in the meantime, do please come and speak to any, any of us. The, the ABL team are here. They've done an astronomical amount um, for my trajectory. I can't say that word. That was a poor choice of words. There. No, I can't say that. But, you know, that everyone, yeah, there's, there's opportunity everywhere. You've just got to go and find it. To add to that, I'd like to say that you maybe don't know what you don't know until you start asking. Um, and this industry is incredible for people just wanting to help. Yeah, um, to add as well. Um, I, I wasn't really aware of the beef research committees, yeah. um, even though I work as a cattle vet, which is pretty sad. Um, <laughs> so I learned about that through ABL and have since joined in that. So there are just so many options to get into the industry. Join Cattle Council. Yeah, <laughs> free! <laughs> One more in the front here. Yep. As a young bloke that is uh, still in school and wants to do something, what, where can we start? Like, yeah. I don't know if I'm the best role model, but I'll just do my best. <laughs> Mate, no, honestly, I did. I was in your position, uh, your same position when I was at school. I had no idea, and I kind of finished up. The guidance counselor pretty well said to me, yeah, just go home, because, you know, what else are you going to do? <laughs> and I'm fortunate enough, like, I, I'd love to see that guidance counselor now and say, have a look, buddy. Um, because, honestly, I've, I've learnt so much. From I left school, went up, worked in the Gulf, worked in the Territory, met absolute wedge of mates that I'm still friends with today. And, and you'll find, and we said this before, we had a, uh, a talk on Tuesday about this and saying, if you just want to show keenness, if you want to learn, if you want to be involved, there'll always be someone willing to help you out. And you just, you just got to let them know, mate. Like, just go out there, have a crack, show that passion, show that fire, and show that you want to learn, and someone will always help you. Sam, if I could add to that. Do you know what LUX stands for? Learning under continuous knowledge. So find yourself a mentor, but if you want to, 10 years or 20 years from now, you want to run a multi-million dollar beef business, start to build your capacity for that now. And that, whether that's getting dirt on your nails or understanding your own budget or um, the people who step into those opportunities later on are the ones that have prepared themselves for it and prepared well all the way along and, and each and every one of us have the capacity to do that. Yep. Probably one last thing, if you see a door walk through it, take that opportunity. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And even that, like don't be afraid, you can learn something from everyone. Like you may not seem it, but you'll learn something. Just always ask questions, be willing, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason.
just a quick one. These guys are amazing. Like what we've done here in ABL is truly amazing. It's changed my life. And I would encourage all of you, if you're questioning or you're a bit lost or you don't know where to go or what to do next, go talk to these people because they will truly change your life. And they need funding. <laughs> <laughs> sort of stumbles down the three steps, staggers along the footpath, bumps into the light post, wobbles backwards, wanders along, up into the car park and gets in his car, and Ned and his mate are sitting in the police car right outside the hotel thinking, you've got to be kidding me, has this guy not seen us? So the next thing, the car, the lights come on, the car starts, he backs up, stalls it, starts it again, drives down, crunches down through the gutter, onto the road, straight past them and heads out of town. And they think, you can't be serious, this guy is a lunatic. So they spun around the police car and pulled him up down the road and said, uh, mate, have you seen us come through the, through the pub tonight? Talking about drink driving? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, blowing the bag. So that Ned puts the thing across and blows in it. <sighs> Nothing. Ned looks at this guy and says, what's going on here? And the guy looked at Ned and he said, you've heard of designated drivers? And Ned said, yep, yep. He said, well, I'm the designated decoy. By the, time they got, <laughs> by the time they got back to the pub, the car park was empty. <laughs> flippancy aside, flippancy aside, you're a bit dusty, please don't drink and drive. As it's been stated by uh, the Minister and every other person that's spoken up here today, you guys are the future of our industry and we can't afford to lose any of you. So look, we're just going to run a little bit of a workshop. And uh, for, look, for some of you it's going to be new stuff. Some of it might be confronting. For some of you, it's going to be business as usual and probably a bit boring. If that's you, help the person that's a bit new for you. So, anyone remember Gary Larson, the Far Side cartoonist? Yeah, with his favourite cartoon. If you can imagine it, there's a guy standing there and he's got a tin of paint in this hand and a paintbrush in this hand. There's a dog sitting there and a cat and there's a tree and a house in the background. He's been around and he's painted on everything. The dog, the cat, the tree, the house, the window, the paint. And, he's, and the caption on these says, there, that ought to sort a few things out around here. And I've always liked it because for me it's about stating the obvious. Sometimes we've got to state the obvious and know exactly what we're starting with, yeah? So part of the activity is going to be just sort of thinking about where, what are we starting with here? If we want to be the next future of agriculture, if we want to take some ownership in the industry, a bit like those two examples I gave you, the, the young couple who started with 50,000 and took a 25% shareholding in a 16,000 stock unit business. 
the young couple who built up 400,000 and borrowed another 900 and took a, uh, let's call it a 10% shareholding in a, in a large scale dairy business. How do you do that? Where do you start? So we thought we'd just do a little bit of a, we're going to do three things and hopefully it's going to be a little bit of fun. So the first thing is we're just going to think about what's our net worth. You've all got a, a diary there, you've got all a uh, beef diary. You may, just want to, you may just want to open that, find yourself with a clean page, and just have a think about, talk to the person beside you and have a think about, yeah. what's my net worth? What's my equity? And I know we, in the banking industry, we talk about this stuff all of the time, yeah? So we're talking about financial equity, not necessarily your personal currency and personal equity. What am I worth? And again, just like those young couple, they came to me and they said, we've got about 50,000 equity. Yeah? So what does it look like? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the what are the key traits of the top operator? We're going to break into four groups and just do that reasonably quickly, um, and, but just get a bit of energy around it and have a think about some of those things. What are the key traits of a top operator or a farm operator either from a below average or to an above average? And we'll split those into the group and we've got four facilitators who will help us do that. And then the third piece is pretty much making my, making my start and making my mark. What are the things that I've got some, so you'll do a little bit of self-reflection and again you might want to talk to the person beside you and say, where are my areas of strength? What are the things that I can strengthen? Remember Tiger Woods, may not be the greatest example, but I remember Tiger Woods when he was at his peak, he said, I never, I never practiced my sand, my bunker shots. I always, that's not my strong point, I always practice my drive so I don't end up in the bunker. So it's, you know, there's, there's some validity in that in terms of working on your strengths, but we also need to think about what are some of the opportunity areas that I've got? But if I want to take control of and be really effective and be a top operator in the industry, delivering results for me, my family, my community, what are some of the things that I need to work on? And we'll be writing those things down so we can sort of cement them in action. And again, following on from the leadership presentation, is you're going to find people that can help you with that stuff. But this is the real value of something like Beef Week and the networks. The people that you bump into, you can actually start asking people those questions. Yeah. So first things first, um, in New Zealand we looked at, through the Red Me Profit Partnership Program, what they say, uh, definition of brilliance is being able to take the complex and make it simple and make the simple compelling. So thinking about some of our farm businesses in New Zealand, how do we, what are the drivers of, of performance in those businesses? And we, we can break it down into four key areas. Feed supply consumed, feed conversion efficiency, cost of production and value attained for the product. So think about the Stephen Covey model, some of those are sit directly in your sphere of control and influence, some of them might sit in your areas of, of concern depending on how connected you are to the market. We put together a model that looked a little bit like this, where we talked about what are the drivers and the results. And interesting, when we, when we facilitated sessions around this with farmers, we said what are the drivers of farm business profitability? Most of them would talk about the results. It took a little while to sort of drill down into, okay, so what's driving those results? What sits below the line? And I know some of this is obvious stuff, right? It's the, it's the Gary Larson piece, but it's about being really, really clear about it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain speaking. Please ensure your seatbelts are securely fastened. Bay tables are right position. That's what it is. Is that what it is? So I, I just share this with you just out of interest, right? But it's just thinking about as a, as a top operator in the industry, what are some of the things I need to be focused on where I can make the biggest difference in the business as I grow my role in these businesses and in the industry? Right, balance sheet. Again, we talk about it all the time. I appreciate some of you probably do as well and some of you may not. So again, if you, if you find that you're quite skilled in this area and the person sitting beside you is not, then just help, help them maybe have a look at it and think about it. For some people, they might have $1,000 of net equity. Some might have 10, some might have 100, some might have a lot more. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of matter, does it? Because it's a bit like that old planting the tree thing. If we know what we've got at the moment and we know what we think we're going to need, what's our plan to get there? But it's about start, starting, starting at a point. In the banking industry, we, our conversations with clients normally, anyone heard of the GROW model for conversations? No? So GROW, everyone loves an acronym, right? And you might want to write this in your book, find another clean page and just write this, G-R-O-W, just down the page. G is goals and objectives. So we're really interested in understanding what are our clients' goals and objectives? What's important to them personally and for their business? Ah, current reality. What's, my, what's the current reality for these people? What's their balance sheet look like? What's their historical viability look like? What's the skill set look like? What are the relationships, the connectedness, the networks? 
So the, again, this is the, the Gary Larson stuff, right? It's just stating the obvious sometimes. For a lot of people, when especially partners and couples, when they're doing it together, all of a sudden they start to get a richness in the conversation because they get some alignment in their goals. Or they get some clarity where they're not aligned. O, options and opportunities. And as you, as you follow the advice of some of your leaders here, you'll find that there's a lot more options and opportunities than you possibly think they were. Thinking about catching monkeys, you know? What are the things that I'm hanging on to that have got me trapped? What are the thoughts and beliefs I'm hanging on to that if I let go of, I'd be fundamentally free to see some of these other options and opportunities? W, any guesses for W? Way forward. What's the plan? What are we going to do? What's the commitment? Students, all year 11 and 12 ag students to L Block staff room now. Anyone? Yeah. All the ag students, exactly. Yeah. Top of the class. Top of the class. So we, we use that GROW model to, to think about, to help, our, help understand our clients' objectives, to help them uh, communicate with us how they see their current reality, how we see their current reality, and then to get really creative and explore some of those opportunities and options and a way forward. So you, you, may, you may find some value in using that for yourselves. Part of this piece, this balance sheet piece, is a bit around the R. So what's my current reality? And it is what it is, yeah? So what do I own? What are the assets that I own? <coughs> so livestock, land, shares, residential property, car, Ute, who's got a ute? Big bull bar? Nice to have one. Uh, yeah, so what, what are the things that I own and what are the things that I own? What are the liabilities that I've got? Bank debts, motor trade finance, any, any other liabilities, family, what are the liabilities I've got? So you just make a list of those in your, in your diary and say, okay, quickly, what are the things that I own? What do I reckon they're worth? If I, if I put them on the market today and said, who wants to buy this? What's, what's it likely to be worth? I'm not going to ask anyone to disclose it, it's not, not my business, not necessarily on anyone else's, but you may want to share it with someone close to you and say, look, I feel really excited because I've got this much equity, or I feel a bit sad because I've only got this much and I'm this age, what can I do? You know, having started having those honest conversations, you'll find, what do most people do when, when you ask them for something? Answer you, human nature's people want to help, so start to share some of these things, yeah? How many people have done a personal balance sheet before? Yeah? Cool. Good. So I'm just waiting for the rest of you to finish it and then everyone will put their hands up, right? Yeah. It may seem like a, it may seem like a funny thing to be doing in a forum like this, but in talking to Emma and the team, we thought, what a neat idea just to get people to start thinking about what am I worth? What's, what have I got in terms of my financial capability that I can start to leverage? And again, i link it back to, oh, I was going to get you to facilitate one of the workshops. Uh, my back and days are right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to go. Where was I with that? Before I was rudely interrupted. <laughs> how do you leverage? Yeah, so how do I leverage off that? So again, you know, the, uh, I'll go back and use it because it should be reasonably familiar now with those two examples I gave. The person who only had 50, the young couple only had 50,000, they were quite flat about that. You know, they were sort of down in the mouth and saying, man, we're never going to be able to do this. We're never going to be able to do it. But you think about the other current reality piece, which is their physical capabilities, their personal currency, the stuff that you can add on to that, how they can leverage that, their family's position, and being able to use securities from family and other people who are prepared to back them to borrow money to add to their capital to give them a start. So again, it doesn't matter whether you've got $1,000, $5,000, 10000 50 or 100 you just want to have a clear picture of what it is that you've got and where you're going to start. So how many people have now done a personal balance sheet? <laughs> Come on, help me out here. We can move on. Good stuff. So if, look, if you haven't finished it, when you get home, just um, sit down and, and start sort of working your way through it. And uh, you, know, you may find it interesting just to, uh, just to put that up on the wall as your starting point, right? Buddha said the journey of 10,000 miles starts with the first step, so this is the first one. Okay, 
Right, now it's time for a bit of activity. I want to do, just as we stand up, I just want to bring a bit of energy back into the room because I'm pretty boring, so I'm going to have a go at sort of doing something brave, yeah? We're going to split this, split you guys into four groups. So we'll have the first couple of rows here coming forward, and I'll have a facilitator come and, and work with you. The, the next group at the back will just form a bit of a circle. Similarly here, we'll do the same thing. And then at the back, so we've got four facilitators who are just going to come and work with you on some questions. And I just want you to be honest and, and answer them. But before we do that, I just want to have a little bit of a challenge. I want somebody big and strong. Big and strong. <laughs> Why is everybody pointing at you, Tiger? <laughs> Right, somebody big and strong. You're prepared to be a volunteer? Come on up here. I want somebody who's maybe not so big and strong, but prepared to have a bit of a go. <laughs> who, who said that? Come on, yep, let's go, let's do this. You might want to bring your hat, you'll need some superpowers with this big fella. Right, I grab a seat. It's called the magnetic chair, so we're just going to do a quick exercise. Your job is to come over here. Holy shoot, that man, look at the size of this one. Hey? So you're just going to stand here and give him a bit of a massage, right? You're just going to help him out a little bit, I know. So you stand here and help him out. So your job, I'm going to, sorry, what's your name? Hugh. Hugh. I'm going to ask Hugh to, his job's going to be to stand up out of the chair, right? And what's your name? Jane. Jane? Hugh and Jane. Nice. So your job is going to be stop him from standing up out of the chair, right? You're not allowed, you can't take this phone, you can't, uh, can't pull his hands off or anything, you can't do any of that sort of stuff, but you've got to stop him from standing up out of the chair, right? Yeah. So we're going to call it, or you guys are going to count down, one, two, three, right? So you've got to stop him, don't let me down, Jane. Right, are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right, we'll do it again. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> it's called the magnetic chair, yeah? It's called the magnetic chair. Now what Hugh's going to do is Hugh's going to think about what's my problem here? What's my challenge? Your challenge is to get up out of the chair, right? So Hugh's going to think about this a little bit. And Jane's not going to relent. She's not going to be relenting at all. But Hugh's going to think about a strategy that's going to get him out of that chair. Yeah? You thinking? I can't hear it. <laughs> So Hugh's thinking, he's thought about his strategy, you ready to go? Yeah? Hugh's now got a strategy to get out of the chair, he's good to go. Let's give him one more countdown. One, two, three. <laughs> cool, all right, thank you very much. Thanks, Hugh, thanks, Jane. So what did you notice? What happened? He's not that big and strong. He's not that big and strong? It doesn't matter if you're big and strong, yeah? What else, what did you notice? Yeah, yeah. How often have we found ourselves trying the same thing over and over and over? Yeah. How, how often have we found ourselves just trying to get up out of the chair, get up out of the chair and we can't do it? We've just got to find another way. Some people slide down, some people go to the side. But it's, it's, sorry? You also asked the question in a different way to make something better. Yeah, I did. Yeah, wasn't I naughty? It's called cool. neurolinguistics, right? Because I said to get up out of the chair. Yeah, yeah. Good work. Good work. You're good at this. Yeah, we're good at this. So I think, and sorry, Hugh, thank you very much for volunteering. Very brave, and thank you, Jane. But, uh, you know, sometimes we've got to think a little bit differently about what it is that we're doing. We need to be prepared to think differently and challenge ourselves. And that's the value of having people around us who are prepared to challenge us. Not everybody who disagrees is an enemy. You know, they're the people who just want to challenge us and get us to think a bit differently about things. So in terms of thinking differently, what we might do is we're splitting the four groups in a sec. But I've, I've asked the, uh, you may not be able to see that, that clearly, but each of your facilitators have got a worksheet that includes these four key areas. This is a workshop we set up in New Zealand just to get people to think about what does a top operator look like? So we have the four groups, one group is going to do vision and track record for the below average operator. Now some of us may have seen those people in the industry and it's, it's not a personal slide on them, it's just the way they operate. And the next group will do vision and track record for the top operator, the high performer. So what we're interested in from you guys is what are some of the observations if you're doing the, if you're doing the below average operator, what are, the, what are your observations of the language they use, the behaviours they exhibit and that sort of thing around vision and, uh, and track record. The other group will do quality information and decision making. 
And again, same thing, one group will be on the below average, one will be on the above average. We're not going to take too long to do this, so we want you to engage reasonably quickly with your facilitator and just start thinking about and volunteering some responses about what are the behaviours and, and language patterns that these people use. And you'll be good at this too, here yeah, with your language pattern stuff, nice work. Right, so, two, uh, four groups, just find yourselves up out of your chairs, moving into a bit of a group, turn your chairs around or something, just get yourselves into a bit of a comfortable space. Who have we got? We've got Ollie, Angus, Alison and Shannon. They'll tell you what they're dealing with. You notice I've picked the boss here for? Yeah, just please come this way. So our topic, and if you're the type of person who likes to read... Good to go. So, we're the, the two bottom boxes, so communication, accuracy. So we're talking about quality information here. So what does it really talk about like? Um, with the type of oh. things they do around the quality of the patients, where is communication, accuracy, timeliness, and support to them. It's about what they know. It's like dealing with the cattle agent. Sorry? It's like dealing with the cattle agent. In my case, so dealing with professional people who yeah. know their area. Okay. Yeah. Do you come in at me and take notes? Knowing when to talk and knowing when to listen. I think being open and open to sharing your knowledge um, and not yeah, putting a cap on that and thinking that what your knowledge is, is not valid or vice versa. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Assessing more than one option. Thank you. 
18, all finished. <laughs> <laughs> Too. Right, how are we getting on, team? Yeah, two minutes, I reckon. Two minutes? Beauty. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, the saying in New Zealand, those who do the mahi get the treats, right? Those who, those who do the work get the rewards. Sorry? Look at this. Look at the debate going on over here. Are they? Yeah. Start coming back together in the interest of uh, in the interest of time. I know there's probably some quite rich conversations going on there. We probably need to pull things back to order. So where are our four facilitators? So what have you got, Angus? What group have you got? So yeah, we've got the the low average operators looking at vision and track record. Nice. Okay. So what are some of the things that you found, what, what did your group think below average operators talked about or did or didn't do with uh, vision and track record? Uh, they didn't have a clear vision. Um, there were no planners, no collaborators, couldn't set goals, lack of reflections, so they didn't look back on, on whether they win, they didn't benchmark themselves, poor change managers, um, didn't adopt a change, uh, didn't learn from their mistakes, protect protectionists um, yeah what else do we have here and then from a I guess a, a track record perspective you know pretty fast uh, high staff turnover poor productivity poor efficiency um, kind of poor culture in the business um, they as leaders they were quite poor quite pictorial um, uh, poor communication close-minded Small network, um, don't understand their net worth, the equity is static, lack of focus, um, and they bring personal stuff to work and quick to blame others, but also quick to claim others' ideas. Yeah, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that blaming piece is interesting. Certainly the behaviours we see in, in those below average operators, yeah, a lot of blaming. Anyone else, if you were thinking about those traits for below, operate, below average operators, anything else to add to those? How easy did you find it to think about those things from a below average operator's perspective? 
one really hard 10 really easy. Easy? Yeah, easy to think about that stuff. We've probably worked for some of them before, I have. I've probably been one of those employers before. Um, yeah, it's, it's relatively easy to think about those things, yeah? But the, the traits and behaviours we see is inconsistency around vision. So you talk to somebody one day and they'll tell you what they're doing, what their goals and objectives are, and then the next day, uh, if you're talking to them and their wife or something, uh, it'll be completely different. Or the husband and wife don't have a, have a shared vision. They're both different if you talk to them separately. Thank you. All right, so who's got um, below average operate? Actually, no, let's go to, no, let's go below average on quality information and decision making. Who's got that group? Shannon, what are some of the insights you had there? Yeah, so that was us. Um, so in terms of the information, it was around not knowing your cost of production, inadequate record keeping, um, thinking you know a lot more than you do and not actioning on it, not being adaptable and inadequate communication of any of the information. And then with that decision making, um, it was around not being focused, not having clear and defined roles, um, poor managerial skills and time management, um, not seeking advice, so like tying in with the thinking you know it all, um, and uh, like a lack of behaviour profiling, so when you're trying to communicate um, a decision and turn it into action, making sure we're treading the line of there's an issue with doing doing it the way you've always done it, that's pretty easy, but then you can also swing to the other end of the spectrum and just like bulldoze the older generation out of it or you know the past managers and it can have equally bad repercussions. So it's about being organised and getting the stakeholders involved in the decisions which a, a a below average producer wouldn't, wouldn't even think about those things. Yeah, good. But a lot of soft skills in there, aren't there? That's the sort of thing Angus was talking about earlier. Probably just in their comfort, sort of happy space and rejecting a lot of challenge. So who's got the below average, uh, sorry, the above average now on track record and vision? Yep, that's us. Cool, Ollie. Uh, yeah, Yes, so we had a bit of a poor facilitator on the track record part, but uh, we, we did all right on the clear vision and the measurable bit. So I suppose, yeah, it was around um, that they were able to set and, and communicate values. A, a big part of that was within their stakeholders, so within their business, it was about who, who was coming along with them, but actually passing that responsibility over so people were accountable for that. Um, they, they were able to maintain relationships with their employees. Um, their, their overall business was measurable, so they, they knew what their key performance indicators were and how, how they could get there. It wasn't just putting words out there, it was actually communicating that. Um, over here we had a really good one, which was around the habits, principles and behaviours. And the, those good, the, the, the best operators are, are striving to be the best, not necessarily of those around them, but it's actually just the best business that they could be. So, um, and then I suppose on the financial front, uh, yeah, cheating a little bit, but uh, it, it is around that, that measurable piece. They know where they are, they know what their costs are, they know what their inputs are, and, and they understand that. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, one of my clients describes it, in fact, it's the, the young fellow who's an equity partner in that dairy farm we talked about. He said, I want to be visitor ready 365 days a year. So I want the farm to be top, you know, ship shape on all the, the dips, drenches, chemicals and things there. You've got to be in these storage areas. Um, I don't want any rubbish and stuff lying around. And I know my numbers. I know, what, I know what stock I've got on. I know what they're doing. I know where we're up to. I know what our growth rates are. I know what our, our consumption rates are. I know what our feed wedge is. I want to know my numbers. And I want my staff to know them too. He was, uh, I'll just digress for a minute. That's a good summary. But I remember when we put that equity partnership together, the young fella said, I'm in so long as we can spend some money on some animal monitoring equipment. I want to know what these cows are doing quickly. So they spent, I think, $300,000 putting some animal monitoring um, equipment in the shed, some technology in the shed. And they brought in, I think, to top up the herd, they brought in 100 R3 heifers from the South Island. And what they could see very quickly in their herd profile after about two months was the bottom end of the herd was going to struggle to do 250 kilos of milk solids per cow. So the average in New Zealand is about 370 kilos of milk solids a cow, yeah? So these ones are going to struggle to do sort of 250, 260 kilos. The R3 heifers they brought in, they were just thumping along, they were on target, they had a profile that looked like they were going to do about 430 kilos a cow. And they said, well, less of those and more of those. 
So that $300,000 investment ended up costing them over a million to change the herd around. But you know, I talked about the product, product, production trajectory. That was one of those step changes. Rather than trying to breathe their way out of it, they bought their way out of it and just made the change and their production went from an average that looked like that to an average that looked like this with that investment because they had that technology and they were measuring and monitoring. Right, so who's got the, who's, yes, who's left? That's me down here. We it's all Speedy Gonzales. You yeah, had your group sitting down, group. orderly, super no group talking. Down here, Matt. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so communication. So when to talk and when to listen, which I thought was a great, great point. Um, yeah, clear communication channels in business. Um, be open and sharing in that respect. Um, seek out professional advice, which I thought was great too. Um, willing to take on and consider new advice. So assess options yep. and act early um, was that one. And then the decision making one was to be agile, um, uh, look forward, uh, look forward rather than backwards. Take feedback, um, take accountability for your actions. So admit your mistakes and learn from those mistakes, um, research things well, um, look at your options and assess them, um, assess the risks around those options. I thought that was fabulous, I'm an economist guy, so I love anything about risk. Pros and cons um, of issues, look at, at things that are against the norm, don't be afraid to think differently. Um, and I reckon that might be us. Good work, job. well done, Thanks well done. Great. Nice work, round of applause for all our facilitators and groups, good work. Yeah, I think hopefully you find that exercise interesting. The groups we've worked with in New Zealand, is, you know, they, the feedback they're giving us, they actually find it quite confronting because as, they, as they're listening to what people are saying about the below average, they think, well, see, that's, that's me. And they listen to some of the things they hear about the above average and say, well, what they start to work out is what we're going to do in a minute. It's just a bit of an exercise. So what are the areas here that we're good at? What are the things we're genuinely good at? You know, let's take Angus's example of there being the, the person that looks in the mirror and really honestly, what are we good at? And what are the things we could be better at that we need to be better at? What are the things that we need to be better at that might not be up to us? It might be that we look, we take the John Palmer principle and we look for somebody, look to employ somebody who's far smarter than what we are to, to, to do the jobs we're asking them to do. So we'll do that in a minute. Um, any other feedback from that session? No? Somewhere in between the below average and the above average has got to be the average, right? So this is not ex extensive or exhaustive and I'm happy to provide it to the, to the team here to circulate to you if you want to make it available. It's just something we put together uh, for some workshops I was running in New Zealand just to start the conversation around what's average, what's above average, what's below average, where do we sit on some of these things that are important to running businesses. Right. So, last activity, probably shall only take a couple of minutes. Anyone heard of Think Pair Share, other than the facilitators in the room? Yeah? So the think piece is just thinking to yourself about the question you've been asked. The pair piece and share piece is just turning to the person beside you, somebody you know, somebody you don't, and just sharing with them your thoughts about these next three areas. And then the commitment piece is starting to write down what's important to you and what do you want to do. So we thought purpose. Purpose is important. So if you think about where, where am I at in terms of my purpose, my vision, my goal, my objectives, how clear am I on that? What do I need to do around it? People. If we're going to be running larger scale businesses, hey, you know, Presto, is Presto still here? No, go on. I thought he was really very, very open and, and vulnerable, vulnerable and, and honest about some of the challenges that he had as he started to, to manage people and learned about managing people, but how important that is to him now. You might want to write this down, you probably already know it. There's a saying that says, um, culture each strategy for breakfast. So we can spend a whole heap of time on structure and strategy, but if we haven't got the right culture in our people around the business, it's sort of, it's dead, right? So where are we at with our people management? And remembering that most people are in family businesses, yeah? And we know that the family business, the family communication and conversations are tough because there's some pretty ingrained behaviours there that we need to try and sort of break through, yeah? And get some help around. And then the last piece is performance, which sort of links to, links to that sort of model. So on farm, before you can do all the other stuff, but if you haven't got good quality performance, sort of moot point, yeah? Let's go back to that beef and lamb data of the that sort of Q3, that 
the average versus the high performance and the difference coming out the bottom line because it's driven by this sort of stuff. It's driven by our focus on performance, it's driven by our focus on people and it's driven by the purpose that we have within our business. So just have a bit of a think about those three things for yourselves. Where you sit on those, if you feel, if you feel comfortable enough doing it, just turn to the person beside you, share a couple of thoughts, their, their thoughts and maybe write a couple of things down in your booklets that you want to, that you, you acknowledge our strengths, that you'd like to continue to work on, you acknowledge your opportunities, that you'd like to get some help around. So just make a couple of minutes doing that. One more minute if there's some things you'd like to write down, please start writing them down. Still going. We're into it. How did you find that? 
Easy, hard, yeah, good. Always good to talk to somebody about stuff, yeah, and just share a few ideas and a few thoughts. I hope that's just a starting point for you, just to think about some of the things that are important to you, that are going to be important to your family and your businesses. You've got your tray tables in the upright position, the money is securely stowed. Yeah, so I, I hope that's a starting point for you, just to take some things home and move it on. You know, if, if you've got partners who are not here, whether they're uh, family, employees, or other people you want to share some stuff with, then feel free just to start sharing some things about where you feel you've got some strengths, maybe get some feedback around that, and areas you can improve on, you know, the Tiger Woods stuff, and areas of opportunity, and be prepared to get some feedback around that. Because it's not personal, everybody wants the next person to be better, a bit like every farmer I've met wants the, the land and the livestock and their environment and community to be better, and better when they leave it than when they started it. People want the same thing for each other, yeah? So I hope that was helpful. If there's any of the resources that I've put up that you want, then just let Emma and the team know, I'm happy to make those available for you. Um, I'll just finish with a couple of things. One, it comes from Doug. Anyone know who Doug Avery is, the resilient drum? Yeah. He's, uh, he and I were chatting about this a wee while ago. And he said, you know, the, the challenge with this four C's piece, this, this courage, capability, confidence, and commitment, is where people think they need to start. And he said, all the workshops he's run on this, where do you think most people think they need to start with the four C's? Call it out. Commit, yeah. Capability, yeah. Courage, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, right? So thank you for those brave people who called it out. As people look at that, they think, oh, that, that sort of makes sense, right? It sort of makes sense a little bit. But some people won't start because they don't have the courage. Or when I get the courage, I'll start. Some people won't start because, oh, I need to get more capable. I need to do some more training or learn a bit more before I start. Some people think, oh, I need to get some confidence and then I can just develop some capability and then I'll have some courage and then I can commit. But the reality is what, they, what, they've worked, what people have worked out is, what do you reckon the first one is? You commit. If you commit and you tell people about it, people are going to help you with courage. People are going to help you with capability. They're going to help you with confidence. So it's a bit like starting to write these things down. This is your commitment to yourself to start. Yeah. So I really applaud you for taking the time in the workshop to, to honestly and, and capably think about yourself and the things that you want to make a change with here. So I'll just go back to, very, very quickly, in fact, while I'm going back, and I just get everybody to stand up and find yourselves in a bit of space. We're going to finish with a little bit of energy, yeah? So you'll need, you'll need a little bit of space, especially uh, you fellas with big wing stands, yeah? Nearly there. Right, so just find yourself angry, just a bit of a stretch because you're going to need this, just a little bit of a stretch from the waist. Yeah. So you'll need, you'll need a bit of space. Put one, one hand out to your side, you'll need a little bit of space. So what I want you to do is I just want you very gently from the waist, you can either twist forward or you can twist back around, whichever way you want to go. But if you just twist, twist in one direction as far as you possibly can, just as far as you can. And once you know where that is, just picture that spot on the wall, yeah? Just picture that spot on the wall. Okay. So once you've got your spot, just relax, come back. Now what I want you to do is look at that spot on the wall that you had. Put your arm up. And I want you to look a couple of feet past that spot on the wall, and I just want you to go straight to it. You ready? Go. Who went past their original spot? Oh, 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 there's some not too flexible people here. <laughs> there's some not too, or maybe you went to, maybe, maybe those people went as far as they possibly could the first time. But what we often notice with that, right, is you go as far as you think you can. You pick the spot on the wall and then you look past it, and it's quite easy to go to it the second time. Yeah, now some of that's because you've warmed up a little bit, some of it's because you've changed your mindset. Yeah. And what I say is a good goal is something that's just out of your reach, but within your grasp. So as you start thinking about moving forward, setting some goals, some challenges for yourselves about uh, building on some, some opportunity areas, leveraging some strengths, think about how you might go to something that's just a bit more out of your reach, but within your grasp, and you can get some people around you to help. Now, what I wanted to finish with was, oh, we're going past it, this piece. So why did I mention fishing? Yeah, I enjoy it and hunting and that sort of stuff, but fishing is important. If you want to catch fish, 
What do you need to do? Be patient, yeah. You need to be out there doing it. You need to put a bit of burley in the water, right? You need to spread some stuff around. If you, uh, if you want to get mates and stuff around you, what do you need to do? Ask them. Yeah, just ask them. That was, the, that was our first day out of lockdown. And I, I texted some mates, uh, Johnny Eastwick, who owns the Boom Rock shooting facility down on the Wellington coast. I asked him if he'd run a session, if I could get some mates and stuff together. And we ended up with about 50 people there, right? It was just fantastic. But we just asked them. And it was the best thing to do coming out of lockdown for us. Uh, fishing again, a bit, bit of burley in the water, right? Sometimes you've got to spend a bit of time by yourself. And it's good to have good companions, especially ones that don't answer back. <laughs> good to get a bit of fresh air and do some things where you're challenging yourself a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm 50 and I had I raced motorbikes when I was in Australia, right? I hadn't ridden for a long time. And to go and do the, the desert storm and trailblazer, trail, trail buster things up at Waiuru on the old army grounds was absolutely fantastic. Riding on the, puff, on the pumice soils and just getting out with a group of 250 people you didn't know making new acquaintances and just challenging yourselves to do things a bit differently and get connected with family. So the reasons I put those here is to link those things, right? If you want to catch more fish, if you want to get land more things in your life, then get a bit of burley in the water and get out there and do it and try it, yeah? And connect with mates, ask for help and really, really connect with family. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure to come over and, and be here to come back home and to be part of Beef Week. I really, I can't thank uh, Emma and the team enough from, uh, from Beef Australia and from, from our, our key sponsors, Auction Plus, Angus and your team, getting, putting this forum on for young people, giving them a bit of an inspiration, a bit of a check up from the neck up to take the next steps. Thank you very much. The Minister spoke truly and honestly, I hope, about their commitment to helping young people in the industry. So thank you very much. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the Beef Week and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Matt. Hope everyone got to get out of that session. Uh, so we'll just conclude today with I just ask Matt, uh, Angus, and Anita to just come up on stage, as well as if those mics that were up here could be returned. Um, and we'll just have a very casual question and answer session. Are you swapping in for Anita, Jane? Absolutely. So if there are any questions from the audience, please fire away. question. Well, I guess the, the tax laws and things in Australia may be a bit different to, to what's in New Zealand, so there could be some implications there. But there's no reason I couldn't see why you couldn't. It might be that you sold the, you sold the trading assets out of that entity into a new entity, where you could have a mixed ownership model and bring in some new capital. Because you know, one of the big challenges here is how do we get capital into a business? And I was talking to Angus before about the capital gains tax issues of changing ownership. Even in a company structure that owns land, if you change ownership, my understanding is you're still subject to capital gains, is that right? On the, on the capital value of those, those shares in that company? Yeah. yeah. So I imagine you could. You could sell the operating assets out of that entity into a new entity and bring some new capital in there, which can, you know, can help mum and dad get a place off farm or down around the beach or something if they wanted to do that, if they were ready to move off the farm. Yeah. But it, it's a good question and I think you really best to probably channel that to some of your, your key non-farming professionals. Speaking as a producer that's gone through succession, the best advice that we were given was to find what everyone in the business, in the family needed first, and then ask your accountant and your lawyer how to achieve that outcome so that at the end of the day, everyone got what they needed. Oh, um, thanks for your presentation this morning, and I think everyone got a lot out of it. I know you um, have just helped everyone figure out their goals, but I'd really 
highlight what any your goals for the future? To do more of this. <laughs> Get out of the office. People, we need to be a little bit vulnerable. Um, and I think um, I've learnt that over the years and, and look, can look forward to more. still in his 90 day probationary period. Yeah, yeah that is coming soon. <laughs> so uh, I've got, thank you all uh, for giving up your time and speaking to us, I think we've all learned a lot. Um, and as if you're not going to choke again, I've got another question for you. Um, you're in a really unique space in ag tech and um, a few weeks ago at Orange when we had the Xander Award we had um, Jock Whittle stand up and talk about um, being a CEO in the agriculture world. You're basically not ready to be a CEO until you're about 65. In the tech world, you're too old when you're 25. Um, how do you find balancing those two worlds where, you, where you're dealing with people, you know, twice, sometimes three times your age, and, and then other people that think you're, you're over the hill already? Yeah, I, I think the trick is to um, it, it's, it's not probably about you as the individual, as, as the CEO, I think it's actually the team. Um, and I know that's pretty cliche, but it, it, um, we, I had somebody come up to me this week and, and spent a bit of time around the stand and um, someone said, I've worked out your secret. And I said, what's that? And they said, you hire these university graduates who are passionate about agriculture, you come in, they work big hours and they you know, they, they just, they do the work. And I said, oh, you're close. I said, really close. But I said, what we do is, yes, we get um, young, you know, graduates, uh, either straight out of university or first time job. I said, but we don't just look for the people that are passionate. Uh, we look for the people that want to have an impact. Uh, and you can pick that up um, in, in the recruitment process. Um, and it's, they have a genuine desire to leave a legacy in some way, shape or form. Um, and so you get those people because you can teach skills. You can teach people to, to code, you can teach people marketing, you can send them, you can teach the technical skills, that's actually very easy. Uh, the hard bit is to teach, the, to, to, to teach and train the attitudes and the behaviours. That's kind of ingrained in them. Um, and so we look for that. Um, we, we upskill them and we give them the, the, the environment to, to train um, on the skills piece. Um, and then we just empower them to leave a legacy. Um, and what that means is, you know, they get projects, they get put in situations where they're uncomfortable all the time. Um, uh, we hopefully uh, create an environment where they're not afraid to fail. Um, if they fuck up, just apologise, it's okay. Don't do it again, um, but if you do do it again, then maybe let's look at, let's actually stop and step back and look at the process because the process might be wrong. And that's why we're stepping, stepping up. So I think it's, it, to, to, to answer your question, it's, it's, it's not one person that is able to, to connect, you know, the next generation of thinking with the older generation um, it's what it is, is by having the right people in the tent with the desire and the impact, with the desire to leave an impact. They bring new ideas, they bring innovation, um, and they're just, they genuinely get out, want to get, get out of bed to help farmers. If you have that, you can talk to anybody who's from 100 through to four years old, uh, and you, you will get through to them over time. Have one last one. Um, a fairly cliche and generic one, I guess, but <coughs> say in a situation that you're in a room like us and all passionate and keen about the beef industry and agriculture, what I guess is one piece of advice um, that you wish you received at our age um, to help you through um, and keep that passion going and, and burning throughout your, the rest of your career? It's directed all three of us? Yeah. <laughs> the Kiwis first. 
<laughs> Ladies first. Yeah. While they're arguing it, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I first came home to the family farm, I'd been out of Australia for a number of years, and I'd been out of agriculture for a decade. Um, and I was so worried about what everyone would think of the decisions I made and the way that I carried myself and the impression that I left on them that I never asked them for help. I wanted to prove that I was as good as the boys at everything. Um, stick your hand up if that's been you at some point as a female in ag. Um, so I had to be able to knock down a bull, cut a calf, you know, weld badly. <laughs> Fix fences, ride a horse, ride a motorbike, all the things. And I, I never stopped and stood back and go, okay, well, where's my contribution? And what am I good at and what do I want to be better at? I just didn't have the, ins the, the self knowledge or the insight to look inside myself and see. And so if I could do it all again at 25, Sam said it before, we've got two ears and one mouth. I wish I'd asked more questions and then shut up and listen. <laughs> so, yeah, nice question, thank you. Well, uh, mine's probably, um, is to find your why, like your purpose. We've talked a lot about purpose, but it really does help. Um, and, I, and I think you, to find your why, you, you can't force it upon yourself. Yes, you can do a bunch of them exercises and, and do a lot of uh, development, and I think that does bubble it to the surface. But I think if you're not ready at, at your age or, or right now in your lives to, to find you, to, to really be able to articulate your why, that's okay. But I think don't forget about it. Always keep it front and centre. And that's what I, I didn't do. Um, because, you know, I got to later in life um, and it was always there. I just, it was in my psyche, it was in my, in the back of back compartment of my brain. Um, but I was able to articulate it at a later stage in my life. Um, and that, that changed my life when I could do that, it really did. I was 31, um, I'd had a baby boy, uh, I'd finished my MBA, I'd had a, uh, I got married, had a baby boy, and like, life was wonderful. Um, started two businesses, looked like they were going down the gurgler, you know, like, so I, I was at absolute high in my life, absolute bottom of my life, all within about a 12 month period. And what got me out of it was working out my why, really did what my purpose. So, um, but I probably wouldn't have, I don't think it necessarily would have changed the path to where I got to, um, to be honest with you, but knowing it's, knowing and thinking about it and keeping it there is really important. Good question. I think three things. One ties into these other responses. Uh, Self-awareness. Just understanding who you are, what you stand for, and what your why is, and what your impact is on others, and what your impact is on them, or their impact is on you, yeah? The other is um, financial acumen, and getting that a little bit earlier, right? So probably would have, uh, I would have managed my finances a bit better, because it's a bit like grass growing, you heard the phrase grass grows grass, you need a, little, you need a few green shoots, right? If you keep cutting, cutting them off and tipping them, tipping them into the till at the pub, then it takes a lot longer for those green shoots to come back, so a bit of financial awareness. And I think the third thing, and the Maoris probably say it best, uh, e haha, te amanui, uh, o te hao, e tangata, e tangata, e tangata. I ask you what is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And just engaging with people, listening, learning, and being vulnerable, open, sharing, um, people make the biggest difference, yeah? So thank you very much for that question, very good one. Right, well, thanks guys. That draws uh, the forum to a close. Probably just before we leave, if we can just have another round of applause for the wonderful speakers that we've had here today. They've done a fantastic job and been very educational.
probably just also want to quickly thank um, the sponsor again, Auctions Plus. Uh, so that's Angus Street and his team. Thank you very much for uh, making this happen. And finally, if we could just have a big round of applause for the next gen committee, if they could just stand up, please. <laughs> Those guys um, up there at the back, you have uh, Emma, Kyle, Beth, Shannon, and Georgia have had to work tirelessly to pull this together for the last few months. So thank you very much. Right, I hope everyone enjoyed it and. Let's go have a beer. <laughs> <laughs>